The equity rally slows a bit, but the sentiment stays the same. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. We're kicking off to the closing bell here in the U.S. And as we're about two hours away from those closing bells, it's pretty quiet. You take a look at the S&P 500. I think we can call that unchanged or just about the Nasdaq 100 up just one tenth of a percent. Even as you see a little bit of a bid coming back into the bond market, a rally uh, building here. The 10 year yield currently down about five basis points breaking below 3.9 percent. How low can we go? We'll see that uh, play out, I'm sure. And then I want to take a look at gold because even as you see that bid come into bonds, Romaine, you're not seeing the same when it comes to gold. Currently off about two tenths of a percent. Yeah, a bit of a weird day in terms of the price action as far as the S&P. Just six of the 11 S&P sectors right now are posting gains on the day, but they are modest gains to boot. But you look a little bit deeper and you are going to find an astonishing rally out there still unfolding when it comes to bank stocks and financial stocks. The indices tracking that sector have now recouped almost all of the losses since the collapse of SVB back in early March. The KBW Regional Bank Index alone rallying more than 37 percent since late October. 47 of the 50 names in that index are up by double digits over that stretch. That includes 50 percent gains for names like Bank United, Synovus and Bank of Hawaii. The broader Nasdaq Bank Index, which includes small community banks, has seen 270 of its 280 members rally over the past two months. The prospects of rate cuts easing worries over some of those unrealized losses, as well as concerns about deposits and the overall health of the economy. Now, those positive vibes which are helping to lift those stocks are also underpinning optimism and speculation in the crypto market. It's back. Bitcoin jumping back above 44,000 today. And that's put a bid under crypto link stocks like Terra Wolf, Clean Spark, and Marathon Digital, as well as Coinbase. But the real winners over the past few days and weeks have been those altcoins, and more importantly, the tokens of the platforms that those altcoins trade on, like Solana and Avalanche. Solana and Avalanche each up more than 10% today, and each having at least quadrupled over the past two months alone. And that sector level sentiment in aggregate leads us to the broader market, which is where we want to start the show. And it's where the rally has finally and firmly broadened out from that magnificent seven. The strategists over at Ned Davis Research, they point to five technical indicators, Katie Greifel. I'm not going to read all five to you, <laughs> but you put them together. And what they say is that collectively it shows that we have seen a much more a broader rally taking place. Well, you bring that conversation to the NASDAQ 100. That's your big tech uh, stock benchmark, and it's being uh, really led higher by much more than just seven names. You take a look at the percentage of stocks above their 200-day moving average in that benchmark. It's 86%. That is the highest reading since about 2021 or so. So again, a big, broad rally. Uh, so too, if you take a look at the S&P 500, of course, a snapshot look at the largest companies in the U.S. market. Take a look at the RSI the relative strength index. We are in overbought territory. Uh, of course, this has been a big rally that's been building, as you can see, really over the last two months. And uh, again, a lot of momentum here, a lot of breath as we really barrel towards 2024. The big question, Romain, is whether this is sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. That is the big question. Let's get some insights out of our next guest and see what she thinks. Catherine Avery is the CEO and president of Catherine Avery Investment Management, joining us right now to help kick us off to the close uh, here uh, as we round out the year here, Catherine. And I'm sure as you know, as you remember, the first you know few months of this year, it was all about those magnificent seven stocks. When you look at some of the rally that we've had over the last, I don't know, six or seven weeks, does it give you a little bit more hope that we are finally starting to see a bit more breadth? Hi, Romaine. Great to see you again. Yes, this has been quite the market that we've had in these past couple of weeks. And yes, I'm very much encouraged by this rally that we're starting to see in some of these very underloved and oversold sectors that we have in the market. And we expect this to continue into 2024. So give me a sense, though, as to what's driving that. Is this just about uh, the drop in rates and the idea that the Fed is done? Is this about the resiliency of the economy? What? You know, I think that the Fed was probably the last thing that we really needed to hear to give that overall confidence for, for investors. I mean, you know, today's consumer confidence numbers, 110 versus an expectation of 104. 
That was huge. Um, existing home sales came in this morning um, up after reversing a five-month decline. I mean, these are significant levels of confidence that we're starting to see in the investor. And I think a lot of it did have to do with the Fed. Um, you know, for a while this year, we had a lot of money that left the financial markets. They went into short-term fixed income instruments because they were able to sit and get paid while they wait at 5%. And now they're saying, well, maybe it's time to come back out again. Again, you know, it looks like it's safe to be out there in the waters. We have uh, an election year coming up next year, and we have a dovish Fed. And people are very, very secure that they're going to have jobs and that the economy is going to keep on going. And Catherine, you talked about how that's bringing some love back into the underappreciated areas of the stock market. Is that a blanket sort of recommendation that applies to everything but tech? Or are there specific sectors, specific industries here that really stand to benefit in 2024? Right. Well, well specifically, two of the ones that are the most undervalued sectors this year and have gotten hurt the most have been financials and energy. And we have good reason to believe that the numbers and the earnings for next year are going to look good in those sectors. Um, and then lastly, you know, industrials looks good as well. We have had a lot of fiscal stimulus from the CHIPS Act, the Infrastructure Act, and that's going to continue to drive the industrials as well. So, I mean, I think those sectors are places that we would look for for value. Uh, you know, keep in mind that the overall valuation on the, the S&P 500 now is about 19 times. You know, interest rates are not going to go back to zero next year, but they will come down and we still are going to have to be mindful of what we pay for stocks. So valuation is always also going to be key. And Catherine, I see in your notes you highlight dividend stocks in particular. And dividend uh, strategies have been interesting because a lot of been money a lot of money has been plowed at dividend stocks, but then you take a look at sort of on a benchmark level, the performance, and it's been lagging overall. How are you thinking about dividends and identifying the correct dividend stocks? Well, well, a couple of different things. You know, last year in 2022, um, dividend stocks had a phenomenal run. And this year, as we moved into 2023, with the interest rates going up to 5% and dividends starting the year at around 3% um, for, for quality type companies, we've kind of had all that money exit and leave into that 5% safety net of, of these, of these short-term uh, treasury instruments. And now we're starting to see that flip-flop because as people exited the dividend stocks and the prices went down, the yields now have gone back up again. So now we're almost getting back into that position again where the dividend stocks are almost as much as, if not sometimes more than attractive than being in a short-term fixed income instrument. You know, because when you're looking at a longer term duration asset, you're not gonna get any sort of inflation protection in those short-term um, treasuries, but you'll have it in, in the dividend stocks. And lastly, you know, you wanna look at quality. So you wanna look for cash rich companies, companies that have free cash flow yields that are trading above their dividend yield. Yeah, absolutely here. And you can certainly see uh, some folks already taking that to heart. Catherine, great to catch up with you. Have a wonderful holiday and we'll catch up with you again, I'm sure, at the start of the year. Catherine Avery of Catherine Avery Investment Management helping to kick things off to the close here on this Wednesday afternoon where we have a great conversation coming up in a few minutes with the CEO of the Orlando Magic NBA team. We're going to talk about their naming right deals with the auto company Kia. Plus, as more container ships reroute to avoid violence in the Red Sea, we'll take a look at how the attacks are affecting ship insurance and what that means for consumers. And why advertising in the metaverse on platforms like Roblox may be poised to unlock a new level of growth in 2024. You definitely want to hear what our guest has to say on that. That conversation is so much more coming up here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. All right, a big deal that we learned about earlier today. Insurance consulting firm Aon is buying NFP for about $13 billion. It's part of a push into the middle market segment of the insurance brokerage and wealth management business. Matthew Palazzolo joining us right now. He's a senior insurance analyst for us here at Bloomberg Intelligence. All right, let's start off first here with why Aon would be interested in NFP. Sure. So uh, 
probably bears a step back on what these companies actually do. So Aon and, and uh, rival Marshall McLennan, they're insurance brokerages. They help the largest companies in the world get insurance. One of the aspects of the market that Aon's been uh, underrepresented in is this middle market. Okay. Marsh built uh, a business, a competitor, over 10 years ago, Aon's kind of been trying to catch up. So NFP is a nice acquisition in that space. So Aon's trying to catch up with Marsh there. And this gets to this idea here then that there isn't a whole lot of overlap, I guess, right? So there are any regulatory issues that Aon might run into with this? It, it's possible. Yeah. So Aon, yeah. a couple of years ago, tried to buy Willis, which was yes. a bigger rival. Yeah. They ran into international antitrust issues. They actually got clearance in Europe yeah. and had problems in the US. They ended up pulling the deal. Yeah. Here, it, it's not like you say not as much overlap. Yeah. I wouldn't completely write off antitrust concerns though because they're moving uh, across the supply chain. So yeah. some of the businesses that NFP has could already do some business with Aon. And Willis is still around. I, still I'm around. still upset that they changed the name of the Sears Tower to the Willis Tower, <laughs> by the way. And God knows if it had become the Aon Tower. <laughs> well, I want to. Anyway, I digress. I want to go back. I mean, on the <laughs> topic on track, uh, of the strategy here, I mean, you mentioned that Aon, this is really so that they're able to compete here and uh, that the fact that they've been losing ground when it comes uh, to Marsh. Does this acquisition, will it help close that gap? Do you think that this will actually work? A little bit. I mean, Aon has had a lot of success driving this Aon business services, driving cross-selling across their units. So uh, they've done it successfully in the past. If they bring this unit on, they can probably catch up a little bit, but Marsh has a, a big head start in that middle market space. Okay, so we'll see uh, how this one goes. But could this kickstart potentially more deals when it comes to this industry? What does the landscape look like right now? So these companies, insurance brokerages, are cash cows. So they're big private equity uh, ownership. The valuations of deals in that space kind of peaked this year. Um, and I think it's actually piqued the interest of these companies to maybe sell uh, some of their businesses. So you could see more. I don't know if, if Aon and Marsh are going to do bigger deals, but you could see some of these bigger mid-sized companies uh, go. Is this the, the trend, though? I mean, we're at this stage now where I feel like it's just sort of these behemoth uh, insurance companies, insurance brokerages that dominate everything now. Is there space at all for, I guess, independent players? So it, it's very fragmented. Yeah. This middle market, the yeah. small market is also very fragmented. Yeah. But almost all the money's at the top. So that's why you see these kind of jockeying for position deals yeah. that'll continue to happen. But there's a lot of room at the bottom, but those will be much smaller companies. All right, Matt, really appreciate your insight. That is Matt Palazzola of Bloomberg Intelligence. And it's interesting, Romain, I know we were, I think it was yesterday, we were talking about uh, this big dearth of M&A volume that we've seen this year. But still, yeah. I mean, deals have been getting announced. Yeah, deals have been getting announced. And I think this is kind of a classic one where you don't have the same regulatory issues that we know some of those early deals uh, that earlier this year kind of ran into those roadblocks. Uh, also, the financing conditions seem a little bit more favorable to investors here. So I guess if it's sound, it makes sense. But, you know, we coming off an era where, I mean, think about how many deals got done that really didn't seem to have any due diligence whatsoever. Yeah, exactly. Like basically, like two executives got into a room together and said, hey, why not? Why not? Let's yeah, see how it goes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, it's going to be interesting to see if the yeah. tide turns. What's your favorite insurance company? Oh, my God. That's yeah. uh, it's a hard one to answer. Okay. I'm going to have to think about that. Okay, Come back right. to me. Okay, sure. Uh, but coming up, <laughs> downtown Orlando's premier sports and uh, entertainment hub. It's getting a new name. We'll speak to Orlando Magic CEO Alex Martins about the new partnership next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, well, more than 100 container ships are taking the long way around Africa to avoid violence in the Red Sea. Oil prices also rising as ships avoid the area, and the U.S. is talking to its allies about the best way to respond without making the violence wor worse. For more, we're joined now by Bloomberg's Gregory White. And uh, Gregory, talk to us a little bit about that multinational task force that was announced this week. How likely is that to deter any future attacks? We don't have an awful lot of detail yet about what exactly the task force is going to be. The uh, U.S. and its allies have been pretty uh, tight-lipped about uh, just how big it is and, and uh, what it's going to do. In fact, some of the members uh, from the region don't even want the names of their countries known, uh, given the sensitivity of it. But it looks like it's going to be a pretty substantial naval presence aimed at deterring further attacks and, and protecting shipping. Uh, remains to be seen whether the Houthis will, will view that as enough of a threat to stop them. Uh, publicly today, they've come out and said that they'll, they'll keep fighting 
fighting. Uh, but those defiant words are uh, become some uh, much their hallmark. Well, well, that's what I'm curious about here, Gregory. As I'm sure you know, I mean, put, you know, increasing the naval presence there in and of itself can be provocative. So if the U.S. is trying to sort of straddle this line of let's flex our muscles, but doesn't necessarily want to fire the cannons here, are we kind of setting ourselves up for, I guess, one of those uh, international incidents, if you will? It's always a risky uh, gamble. It's a similar one, I think, to what we saw with the. Uh, in the early days of the uh, operation right after October 7th and the uh, Hamas attack on Israel when the U.S. deployed carriers to the eastern Mediterranean uh, in an effort to deter Hezbollah, another Iranian-backed uh, group in the region, from, from entering the fight. Uh, so you have to kind of balance. So not reacting at all is, is not an option given the oh, disruption of shipping and the uh, extreme importance of the Red Sea as a shipping route here. Uh, but you've also seen the U.S. has been so far quite reluctant to strike back in yeah. on the ground in Yemen, which they could obviously do if they wanted to. We're in conversation right now with uh, Gregory White, who uh, helps uh, lead our coverage down in our uh, Washington, D.C. Bureau. We want to bring Julia Fanzaris, though, into this conversation uh, here in New York, who helps cover uh, the oil uh, shipping market for us here. And uh, just to expand off of what uh, Gregory was just talking about here, Julia, this idea uh, of beefing up the U.S. naval presence there here, give us a sense here of what the disruption has been for those tankers that are, would normally, I guess, be trying to navigate that Red Sea. I assume they've already looked for different routes. I think what's important to note is that only around 8% of crude and product ex exports go through the Red Sea, and it's really going to impact shipping insurance. So sure, that risk premium has been injected into the market, but we haven't seen actual large disruptions of the product yet. And But because obviously we cannot foresee what the escalations are going to be, that's why you have the risk premium. But overall, the market is still bearish, and that's why you have seen prices come down from the earlier highs. That's what I want to follow up on, because you take a look at the actual price of Brent, of course. We have seen uh, a little bit of an uplift, of course, uh, Brent closing in on $80 a barrel, but not exactly panic levels. Is this still very much a supply-driven story when it comes to oil? Absolutely. And you'll see that Brent is actually, uh, the spread between WTI and Brent is widening because WTI, Cushing, there is still a lot of barrels coming from Cushing, which is the delivery point for WTI crude. And Obviously, traders are not shrugging this off by any means, but they are paring back their bullish bets, ending the year as well, because a lot of traders are soon logging off for the holidays. And Gregory, as Julia mentioned, of course, this is a developing situation. It's hard to game plan too far out into the future. But of course, Bloomberg has reported that the U.S. is considering military action against the Houthis, of course, not just deterrence, but maybe going on the offense here. What is the latest that we know? Yeah, our sources have been hearing that clearly if the uh, task force isn't successful in deterring further attacks that the U.S. is ready to, to take f uh, further steps and potentially even something like a military strike against the Houthi bases in uh, Yemen. The risk there is quite substantial, though, obviously, of, of spreading the conflict of uh, a, a wider war and, and, in fact, giving the Houthis the kind of recognition that they want because there is an argument that they're seeking the, 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 this sort of ratification of, of U.S. retaliation would be a big uh, boost for their prestige as a uh, rebel group. Of course, I mean, a, a lot of the concern, too, particularly in the market, of course, has a lot less to do with the Houthis uh, in, in specifically here, Gregory, but more importantly, the links with Iran and whether engaging with the Houthis in some sort of meaningful way ends up with, I guess, effectively another proxy war. Yeah, that's absolutely right. The, the question is how far can you push any of uh, Iran's uh, allies and proxies in the region before Iran gets involved? And that's a question we really don't have an answer to and the U.S. has been very cautious about, but at the same time uh, tr tried to send uh, as strong messages as it can uh, to Tehran. And so, Julia, I remember, you know, some years back, I can't remember the exact years, maybe a decade or so ago, when you had all that pirate activity uh, off the uh, coast of uh, northern Africa, and you saw a lot of these shipping companies really beef up their own internal security. The idea was you can't necessarily re rely on whatever uh, Navy was in the region. You basically had to have your own uh, armed forces on those ships here. Have we heard anything from any of those companies about taking, I guess, a little bit more proactive measures to protect their cargo? Not from what we've been hearing. They have just been staying away from the Red Sea. Obviously, you have companies like BP saying, no, we're not just not going to ship there. Mm. So I think that has been waiting it out and seeing what's going to happen with the U.S. first. Yeah.
Waiting it out, wait, uh, waiting to see what happens. Gregory, let's talk about, uh, of course, what this could mean when it comes to the inflationary environment. Of course, uh, the Biden administration has been really uh, championing Biden economics, the progress that's been made when it comes to bringing inflation down. But as this situation develops, of course, it feels a bit out of their hands, to say the least. Absolutely. As Julia mentioned rightly, that for the oil market so far, the impact hasn't been enormous, but we've seen it in a variety of other goods. This is a key shipping route for all sorts of things from Asia. IKEA today came out and reported that they'd have uh, disruptions to deliveries. They didn't know how long it would take and whether or how much they'd be able to reroute. So this kind of, oh, if this is sustained and if we see uh, freight shippers rerouting in a, in a big way, that's obviously going to be a problem for uh, the uh, Biden administration's efforts to drive inflation lower. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we've already seen some of the issues play out. I mean, even before we got into this Red Sea situation, you're dealing with drought conditions uh, in some of the other uh, major trade routes, including the Panama Canal. And of course, we all know what happened back when the Ever Given got stuck in the Suez Canal. That was like five days where we were sort of raptured by it being stuck there. But it took like two months to get that whole supply chain back up and running. Absolutely. These are uh, very complicated supply chains. And once you reroute a ship, the distances are great and the, uh, the, all, it's not something you can switch right back on. So if this gets drawn out and if these efforts to uh, control the Houthi threat uh, are not successful, then obviously uh, this could become a broader economic problem. And that's, I think, a, a, a point that's of pressure for the Biden administration as they look at uh, how to weigh what kind of response and how muscular that should be. Yeah, investors already adjusting here, of course, uh, bidding up uh, some of those container companies and bidding down some of the folks on the downstream of those supply chains. Gregory White in our Washington, D.C. Bureau and Julia Fanzaris here in New York, a breakdown here of the situation in the Red Sea and the impact on shipping worldwide. Uh, stick with us. Uh, well, actually, Katie, I know you've, get, you're, um, you've been following this a lot as well. And I, I am curious, I mean, we talk about the disruptions to supply chains. And to Greg's point at the end, how long it takes to get things back up and running. Like I said, Ever Given was basically a week-long yeah. episode, and yet it really did take two months to get things back to quote-unquote normal. Exactly, and I mean... And that was one ship. Exactly, one really <laughs> yeah, big ship, a big uh, one. to say yeah. the least. In a very but, narrow little thing. I mean, it's a yeah. really important point, yeah. too, and I, I think we were talking about this yesterday, too. You think about how fragile the supply chain is and how it finally feels like we can safely say we are back to normal. But, of course, you think about the implications here, and, of course, this is a quickly evolving situation. We can't really speculate too much here, yeah. but this is a very, very important route, and you think about the flow of goods right now, especially in the holidays. Yeah. Uh, timing here matters. It'll be interesting to see whether it does impact actual consumers, because we know during the pandemic when everybody, everyone had a story about that couch that wow. they ordered or their whatever, yeah. you know, that they took, you know, like six months to get here. And if we do get back to that, then that's when I think you start to see inflation expectations change. And then, of course, that becomes a problem for the Fed. More importantly, in an election year, it becomes a problem. For the president. Absolutely. And it's interesting yeah. we're having this conversation when we did get consumer confidence figures that really rebounded. Again, it feels like supply chains normalizing, consumer confidence coming back. Uh, we'll see if that changes the narrative at all. All right. Let's talk about something more fun. You like basketball. You like Orlando. You like Kia. All those stories rolled into one. Alex Martin, the CEO of the Orlando Magic. He's up next right here on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Taking a look at the markets right now, a bit of a breather here in that equity rally, but still some activity going on in the commodity space. Let's get right to Abigail Doolittle, who's standing by with our commodities close. Abigail. Yeah, we're looking at a small decline overall for commodities. The Bloomberg Commodity Index down, uh, I think, less than half a percent or so. But you can see lots of red on this screen. First, though, let's take a look at WTI uh, crude oil, up about four-tenths of one percent, well off of its highs earlier, up one percent. And, of course, we're some disappointing inventory data. That seems to be weighing on oil, at least crude oil, WTI crude oil, uh, more so than fears around supply having to do with the uh, Houthi rebels uh, in the Red Sea. Natural gas down once again, down 1.9 percent, which is not intuitive given that situation. Um, but that is what we do have. Gold taking a little bit of a breather, down about one-tenth of one percent. Sugar, a bigger decline, down 2.4 percent. Let's take a look at the biggest decline, though, and that is coffee, or at least the biggest decline I could find. Coffee on the day is down 
5.8%. This is a five-day chart, so you can see that coffee had really been doing nothing. Yesterday, up by about the same amount. That was the most uh, since the end of November, Romaine, apparently a short squeeze. But traders today focusing on weather in Brazil. Apparently, there's a pretty healthy rain uh, there or coming that should help coffee and supply. We're looking at the worst day for coffee since July of 2021. All right, our thanks there to Abigail. To a little a closer look at the commodity space, let's take a closer look at sports, particularly the NBA. Professional basketball and its Orlando Magic franchise has a new name to call home. Kia, the car company, is purchasing the naming rights to the Central Florida Sports Arena, which was formerly known as the Amway Center. Joining us now from the newly renamed Kia Center, Orlando, is Orlando Magic CEO Alex Martins. Uh, Alex, uh, thanks for being on the program. And I guess for all our viewers, just so they know, if they go down to the stadium uh, tonight uh, for the game, uh, I think you're up against the heat, the Miami heat here. They're going to see uh, something new, I guess, uh, at the stadium. Uh, and that's right behind you in the background. Kia, you've had a longstanding relationship with Kia. What did it take here to get them on the side of the building? Romain, Katie, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a landmark day for two real global brands in Kia and the Orlando Magic. Uh, both brands on a similar trajectory. Um, Kia, obviously, a, a growing global uh, automobile manufacturer, and the Orlando Magic certainly uh, on the upswing in terms of its competitiveness on the on the basketball floor. But as you mentioned, Kia has been a longstanding partner of the Orlando Magic now in their 16th season with us. Uh, we know each other very, very well. Uh, this opportunity presented itself when Amway decided to shift uh, their resources to our international marketing uh, focus. And we went out to the marketplace and really spoke to over 300 different brands uh, from around the world and ended up with the partner that we've had, you know, right in our fold for, as I said, 16 seasons now. Yeah. And uh, it's it's a great day for, for both of our organizations. Of course, yeah, that longstanding relationship. And, of course, a lot of fans, of course, they remember uh, that iconic dunk uh, by Blake Griffin uh, a few years back uh, over a Kia, which I was told he wasn't allowed to use, like, a, a convertible or whatever he wanted to use. He had to use a, a sedan or something. Are, are, are we going to see repeats of those types of, I guess, promotions, stunts, whatever you want to call them? So it's not just basically Kia on the side of the building, but there will be a much more uh, interactive and immersive use of Kia and its products? Well, you, you, you bring up a great point in that uh, Kia has also been a longstanding partner of the NBA League in general, the official car of the NBA and of the WNBA and of the G League. And um, so, you know, there have been many of those type of uh, opportunities over the years, particularly centered around league-wide events. Uh, of course, we have the standing Kia Rookie of the Year and Paolo Bancaro, who plays on our team. Uh, but as it relates to the activation of this partnership, uh, it's really going to be about giving opportunity to those who are Kia owners when they come to the Kia Center to experience not just Orlando Magic Basketball, but one of the almost 200 events that we have here at the Kia Center on an annual basis. And whether it's a special lounge that we will have for Kia owners or special promotions or, uh, you know, s some discounting, wh what have you, um, mm -hmm. there will be a lot of opportunity for those that own a Kia which, by the way, uh, Orlando is the biggest market in the state of Florida for Kia Motors. And Florida is now the number one state in terms of market for mm -hmm. Kia America. So uh, a lot of Kia owners here in central Florida and throughout the entire state. And they'll be able to take advantage of a lot of opportunities here at the Kia Center. And Alex, let's broaden out and talk about other potential deals, of course, at an NBA level, because we know that the NBA media deal expires next year, and the league has discussed potentially bringing in one or two uh, more partners, the likes of Netflix, Amazon, et cetera. In your eyes, what does any potential new partner need to have? Well, the NBA brand has never been hotter, and certainly uh, viewership is once again up. We just came off of our in-season tournament for the, for the first time, our inaugural in-season tournament. And, you know, the example of here in, in Central Florida and in the Orlando market, when we played our in-season tournament games on the same nights a year ago in November, uh, compared to those nights, our ratings were up 165% this year during the uh, in-season tournament. So clearly, uh, you know, the NBA brand is, is strong. Uh, there's a lot of demand for NBA basketball. We have over 2 billion uh, on social media who interact with us uh, worldwide. So in, in terms of the next media deal, obviously we've had great relationships with our current partners. 
at Disney, ABC, ESPN, and then of course at Warner Brothers Discovery with TNT. Uh, but we all know that the, the streaming platform has exploded mm. and many younger users uh, and viewers are shifting you know, to streaming platforms and we, we all know about the cord cutting and actually the cord nevering that's, that's happening now, particularly with, with younger viewers and, and you know, NBA fans in particular. So clearly there's a demand there. Uh, I, I do foresee that it, you know, at some level uh, we will be you know, streaming our, our games both nationally and locally. Um, you know, currently we are streaming them on our, our current Bally Sports platform, but we all know that Diamond Sports is going through their bankruptcy. But having said that, you know, streaming will be a big part of our, our reach, you know, to our consumer base and to our fans. And certainly uh, the NBA product is one that we believe will be, you know, incredibly popular uh, on whatever streaming platform uh, the NBA ends up on. Well, Alex, in addition to streaming the live games, how important is original content when it comes to the NBA and the NBA brand? And are there any projects in the works? Katie, it's never been more important, to be honest with you. As a matter of fact, here at the Orlando Magic, we've beef beefed up our content production team uh, to create more behind the scenes type content, as you say. Uh, and we've been utilizing it currently, you know, through our social media platforms and, you know, through uh, our uh, regional sports network, uh, et cetera. But we're preparing ourselves for a much more direct to consumer type model uh, where the, the team itself will go directly to our fans, not just here in Central Florida, but everywhere around the world. And, uh, you know, the NBA has now loosened up all those restrictions on our teams as to where we can market and ultimately where we can direct our content to. And here at the Orlando Magic, we're really at the forefront of getting prepared, you know, to push that content out uh, to all of our fans around the world, um, you know, in whatever manner they want it and when they want it. You know, our commissioner, Adam Silver, uh, says to us all the time, you know, we have over a, a 2 billion fans around the world of, of the NBA and only 1% of them mm -hmm. will have the opportunity to see M NBA games in person. And so that gives us great opportunity to create this content, deliver the content and speak directly to our fans all over the world. All right, Alex, appreciate you taking uh, time for us. Uh, and of course, uh, the Magic off to a pretty good start this year, 16 and 9. Are you going to beat the Heat tonight? Well, we certainly hope so. <laughs> it should be a, a great in state rivalry at the Kia Center tonight. Alex Martins, the CEO of the Orlando Magic, there, fresh off the announcement uh, of the new uh, Kia Center down there in Orlando, replacing Amway here as the official uh, name uh, of that stadium. Still ahead here on the big program, a focus on consumer spending and a focus on consumer staples. The Consumer Staples Index on the S&P 500 down about 3% year to date. We're going to talk to Morningstar's Erin Lash about why that is and the companies that she's watching in the sector that could actually rebound. That's coming up next on The Close. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Discover Financial. City lifting its recommendation on the credit card company to buy from neutral, citing more clarity about the scope of credit card losses for the current quarter. The analyst also sees the potential earnings growth from Discover's decision to end that student loan business. Those shares up for a third straight day. Next up, let's take a look at Clear Channel, a clear path for the billboard and advertising company, which got an upgrade to overweight over at Wells Fargo. The analyst says Clear Channel's core markets, such as in Los Angeles and San Francisco, they are finally recovering, and the company has the potential to further expand across the country and into airports. Investors like what they heard. Those shares shares up 10% on the day. And finally, let's take a look at Costco. Cut to neutral over at North Coast Research. The price target set at 620, with North Coast saying that Costco's current share price, well, it basically reflects his position as a powerful wholesale retailer with a loyal membership base. That's a long-winded way of saying this is basically a valuation call. Costco is still the top performer in the S&P 500 Consumer Staples Index this year, and there's a big reason why. Shares pulling back just a bit on the day, down about 2%, and those 
are some of our top calls. We do want to stick in the consumer staple space, and we were just pointing out Costco is basically the outperformer in that space. But once you get past the Costco's and Walmart's here, there's been a lot of pain out there. Since 2018, as inflation squeezed consumers, pulled back on spending, that actually helped to bid up some of those stocks, but some of the bloom has come off the rose. Aaron Lash joining us right now, analyst over at Morningstar, to talk a little bit more about, I guess, the potential, if you will, for the sector as a whole and for specific names, if you will. And Aaron, I do I do want to start off with the sort of the general, uh, I guess, macro conditions, general consumer spending conditions, and whether consumer staples hold up in an environment where everybody seems to think that we've kind of averted recession. Yeah, I think it's been very interesting. To your point, consumer uh, staples names, particularly on the consumer package goods side, um, have been hit particularly hard um, this year. And we attribute a lot of the downdraft uh, to concerns as it pertains to consumer spending overall and the extent to which consumers are going to begin to increasingly um, purchase lower priced private label as they look to constrain um, their spending or, or, or you know, uh, fix their spending um, on essential items. And the ultimate response that these consumer staples operators take, meaning will they continue to invest behind product innovation and marketing support to support the long-term health of the brands and ultimately their relationship with their retail partners, mm -hmm. or will they ultimately opt to re-engage and, and reinitiate promotional spending that has essentially laid idle for the better part of the past three years, given the massive imbalances that we've seen from supply and demand. Well, Aaron, compare and contrast what we're seeing in consumer staples as a sector versus consumer discretionary, because consumer staples, of course, down about three and a half, four percent for the year. Consumer discretionary up uh, 42 percent year to date. A lot about this year, about this economic cycle has been weird. But that particularly feels strange, of course, when you think about those recession concerns that Romaine brought up. Yeah. I think that it's it's it is very very interesting, and consumers have been exhibiting um, different, um, I guess, uh, pensions as it pertains to their purchasing. Right. So we think about travel, for instance, and travel is an area where we still see um, continued demand, but we have seen consumers pull back um, as it relates to things that are related to housing, home furnishings, and things of that nature. Um, so there's been a definite. Um, uh, split as it pertains to where consumers are opting to purchase and what um, they continue to find value in. Um, and it's possible that they could look to constrain um, or limit some of their spending um, on the dis uh, the staple side yeah. so as to afford more funding um, on the discretionary side. I do want to ask you uh, about kind of the other side of the coin, and that's how some of these uh, companies are dealing with just some general stresses going on in the market. A little bit earlier, we were talking on this program about uh, some of the potential supply chain disruptions from uh, issues going on in the Red Sea, uh, a drought uh, in the Panama Canal, uh, and basically a lot of shipping routes that have been completely disrupted. And I'm wondering if, and if so, how much that could have potentially affect some of these consumer goods companies that do rely on overseas markets to uh, source some of their goods? Yeah, I think that it could impact um, some of these firms. But I do think that, you know, the, the pandemic has led a number of these operators to really make sure that they are pursuing multiple sources um, for access to the raw materials and supplies that they need um, within their product portfolio, such as to limit um, when um, situations like this arise. The other factor at play is not just in terms of what consumers ultimately see on the shelf, um, but is the access to um, technology and automation and, and things of that nature that go into the plants. Um, if you think about uh, the supply chain imbalances that we've seen over the past few years, mm -hmm. it has impacted certain firms' ability to extract inefficiencies from their business in terms of, of their manufacturing facilities, their distribution facilities, um, and things of that nature. And so that could be a carry-on effect that's not necessarily evident to the end consumer, but could the, that could ultimately impact um, the profitability of these businesses in terms of the financial performance that they ultimately report. 
All right, Aaron, uh, it was great to catch up with you. Always wonderful to talk to the folks over uh, there at Morningstar out in uh, Chicago. Aaron Lash over at Morningstar. A closer look here at some of the consumer staple sector and consumer staple stocks as we focus in on the health of the consumer. And coming up after the break, a focus on the health of advertising, particularly in the metaverse. Our next guest actually says that advertising in the metaverse might actually be poised to explode in the year ahead. Ann Hand, the CEO of Super League Enterprise, she's joining us next right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. A relatively new form of marketing may be positioned for rapid growth. Advertising budgets for immersive platforms like Roblox, Minecraft, Fortnite could grow to $1.9 billion by 2028. Now that would surpass traditional social media platforms like TikTok. Joining us right now is Ann Han. She's the CEO of Super League Enterprise, which has been helping companies like Chipotle, like Mattel, like Disney, design their metaverse marketing plans. And Ann, I'm great. I'm, I'm pleased to have you on the program, mainly because I feel like there's so many misconceptions about the metaverse, and I think we can blame Mark Zuckerberg for that. But there's, I mean, I, I mean, when we look at sort of what Roblox is, what Minecraft is, and Fortnite, and some of these other examples here, I mean, it's very clear the opportunities there to expand the advertising reach here. What right now is holding that back, if at all? Mm, it's a great question. You know, I often say when I'm talking to CMOs of some of the most powerful brands in the world is, you know, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to forget the word gaming. When you think about things like Roblox and Minecraft and, and increasingly Fortnite and other open world, virtual world platforms, um, because especially in Roblox alone, the majority of people who are playing there are hyper casual gamers. And most of the games they're playing don't have points of winners and losers. They're role playing games. It's more about the community and the co-creation. I think you'll notice if you look closely at Roblox's earnings and other announcements, they don't really use the word gaming. They see themselves as just a next generation social media platform. And what I often say to brands is, Think of it as just an additional marketing channel, no different than you have a strategy for Instagram, TikTok, and other channels. Is that strategy going to be, I guess, a little smarter, a little better, and I guess a little bit more inversive rather than just that proverbial sort of billboard type ad that still kind of inundates us across various platforms? 100%. In fact, I often say, you know, when you think about the metaverse and Web3, and I, I shy away sometimes from those words because it comes with all this connotation of people being in fully immersive VR headsets, which you don't need for these platforms. There's already a half billion people playing it without all of that equipment. Um, but the difference too is, is that, you know, we've lived in a world of the internet where your finger or your mouse is what guided you through the experience. And what Web3 means to us and these immersive platforms is that your digital avatar. And what it means is it allows brands to now have a very intimate one-on-one -on -one conversation with, with the consumers that they're seeking, that they're hard to reach and they're, they're hanging out more. Right now, um, the average Roblox users in that platform 156 minutes a day, as compared to the next closest is TikTok for 95 minutes. So they're there, their engagement's off the charts. And this allows brands to have a more intimate conversation that's personalized and customized and doesn't feel like the internet advertising that we all have known for the last 15, 20 years. Well, Ann, can we talk a little bit more about what those ads actually look like? Is it, you know, you're moving through this virtual world and you just have to watch a 15 or 30 second video, or is it more along the lines of product placement or like Romaine said, a billboard? Yeah, it's, it's really product placement on steroids in many ways. We have. Um, at Super League, we, we create immersive experiences for brands. We have immersive media products that we've created. And also we are a, a partner with Roblox and reselling their media products. Um, and we can also create other custom content that can live outside the platform to further amplify. But an immersive experience means that baked into the landscape of the game can be brands, experiences, or other types of IP. So we recreated Barbie's dream house in the metaverse and you could swim in the pool and DJ on the roof deck. We had a very successful campaign with Chipotle where we created a build a burrito restaurant. You go in, you eat a burrito, you, well, you first make it, wrap it, unwrap it and eat it. The average dwell time in the build a burrito was 14 minutes, which I had a good laugh with the Chipotle <laughs> CMO. 14 minutes to eat a virtual burrito, yeah. um, you know, versus probably they, you eat one faster in real life. 
Um, and and so and that's the power of the digital to physical crossover too. And and what what Aaron was talking about earlier with Chipotle, that Build a Burrito program, we gave away 130,000 free in real life burritos in 30 minutes and is still to this day their highest digital app download day ever. So we prove that that digital, digital and physical crossover that's so meaningful now for brands and retailers, we can deliver on. All right, Anne, really appreciate your time. That is Anne Hand. She is the CEO of Super League Enterprise. And of course, we're keeping an eye on the markets right now with just over an hour to go uh, until those closing bells remain. It looks like sentiment souring a little bit when it comes to the equity market. Yeah, it's 256 here in New York at 253. That is the low of the day on the S&P 500, as well as most of the other indices right now, which are now all uh, deeply into the red here. Of course, this is on the back of a pretty relentless rally here, so maybe a bit of profit taking here at the end of the year. Exactly. And we should also point out the volume relatively low. Of course, uh, it is December 20th, so maybe that shouldn't uh, be too much of a su surprise. But after, like you say, Romain, a really relentless rally makes sense that maybe, maybe we're seeing a little bit of a breather here. We're going to walk you uh, through all the cross asset uh, action today in equities, in bonds, in the commodity space and everything in between. Stick with us. We'll be back in a moment. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, synchronize your watches. It's almost 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romaine Bostick. And I'm Katie Greifeld. A pretty interesting reversal here uh, in stock. So we actually opened lower, believe it or not, but we actually tracked higher. A modest gains uh, through most of the day. And then over the last uh, 30 minutes or so, we really saw a significant uh, reversal here that has now pushed stocks back to session lows with the S&P, the NASDAQ, uh, each down about a percent here on the day. Yeah, and it's quite uh, visually stunning to see that reversal again like an hour ago when we opened up the show we were just about unchanged so yeah. uh, a big plunge there interesting you're not seeing uh, any drama when it comes to the bond market of course mm -hmm. uh, we're about five six basis points lower basically about where we've been most of today so uh, whatever's going on in the equity market it's not bleeding into bonds just yet uh, mo one thing I'm most concerned about is look, to take a look at the Russell 2000 and we can flip up the board here because remember that was kind of the bright spot that was sort of the barometer of the broadening out of this rally that was the outperformance that we had seen. Remember, 1637, that was uh, the year-to-date low on the Russell 2000. That was bank back in late October. And it's really been a rocket ride up ever since. We had like a 24% rally since then. But it's really now starting to hit some of those key technical levels here. I was taking a look. That main level uh, of resistance is right around that 2000. Uh, 44 mark, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, to be precise here. And it gets to this whole question here of sort of whether it can sort of overcome that or whether that 24% rally we've had was kind of it. Yeah, I mean, you take a look at that big yellow line there, and it really tells the story uh, where this uh, rally has really run out of steam in past. That's a mango. That's a mango line. Mango colored, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Delicious. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see whether uh, this is going to it's act as 2024 is color of the year. Really? I don't know. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll believe anything you tell wow. me. Let's move on. Around, Let's yeah. talk about FedEx because uh, what a move that we're seeing in FedEx. Of course, you broke the earnings on the close uh, as they hit yesterday, and it was disappointing. Uh, a profit miss really driven just by their express unit. Of course, that is their air freight unit, uh, largest unit for FedEx by sales. Uh, it just, it, it's not going too well. Of course, demand out of Asia is still sluggish and uh, overcapacity concerns as well. That's leading the stock to its worst day in over a year on FedEx. Let's also talk about General Mills because General Mills also not having a great day, uh, taking the stage, cutting its outlook for organic sales growth that is after a slower than expected volume recovery really comes back to cautious consumer behavior. It's been sort of a, a mixed bag, of course, sorting through yeah. all these earnings when it comes to the consumer, but not. In Are you doing these puns favorites. deliberately here? <laughs> really yeah. not. So what is uh, that? General Mills, that's like what? Cinnamon Toast Crunch and uh, yeah, exactly. all those. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, let's move on, though. Let's I need context, Katie. Of course. Uh, I'm trying to give it in these uh, few seconds that we have less. So let's talk <laughs> about Micron. We only got 20 seconds. There. Uh, of course, Micron earnings coming after the bell. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but right now this share is down by about three or so percent. What's the uh, sort of big product that I should know that they make? Probably chips. Oh, it's not branded? Not the types you eat. They don't come in a bag. Oh, okay. Maybe they do. I would think a little plastic bag I've actually never ordered them. To protect it. We are one hour away from those closing bells. Micron earnings after the bell. Our cross-platform coverage of today's top story starts now. 
countdown to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, this is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Katie Greifeld. We're joined right now by our colleagues Tim Senevic, joined today by Bailey Lipschultz in for Carol Masser. Welcome to our audiences across our platforms on Bloomberg Television Radio Originals and our partnership with YouTube. Uh, it felt like the conversation, uh, Tim Stenevic, uh, maybe just 30, 40 minutes ago, was going to be a bit different here. Yeah. We had an extension of that rally. That's a reversed in a big way with all the major indices right now at session lows. Yeah, good reminder that stocks don't always just go up. Uh, in fact, our own Abigail Doolittle, market supporter for Bloomberg News, pointing out just moments ago in an email, this is the biggest decline that we've seen in the S&P 500 since October 27th, Bailey, and that was the first time that we'd actually seen uh, the rally begin that we've been uh, talking about with the S&P 500 up just roughly about 15 percent since yeah. then. Everything, everything seemingly going up and to the right. So many traders more than happy to downplay what the Fed had been saying to push back against Jay Powell's dovish comments. But now it does seem like volume is ticking higher, Katie, and that could maybe uh, put a dent in the uh, Santa Claus rally that normally should be coming around in the coming days. And I mean, I just feel like uh, when we're talking about big moves in the final hour of trading or so on December 20th, we should approach this with a grain of salt, whether there is anything fundamental here, whether this is more technical position driven, uh, but quite a big reversal hasn't been matched by the bond market, which also uh, creates a little bit of a question mark as to what's really going on here. Yeah, still a lot of questions, though, about the health of the economy and more importantly, kind of the pace of inflation and I guess some of the pockets of inflation that are still out there. Uh, yeah, that's certainly true. I mean, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about as a parent uh, is, uh, and this this story really struck a chord with me, is the cost of education. Uh, not just the cost of like, you know, how much it costs to raise kids and take care of kids, but how much it actually costs to send them to college? Because we're trying to save money in the old 529s right now, but it's kind of unfathomable to think how much tuition is going to go up. Well, the Wall Street Journal, uh, this they covered, uh, a, a, they, they covered this today in an interesting way. They talked about the rising cost of college, not from the perspective of tuition, Bailey, but actually the rising cost of college from the perspective of housing. And it turns out a big portion of the inflation that we've seen in overall college prices has to do with where these students are living. Yeah, and that's coming from that report looking at a dozen public colleges across the country going back 20 years. They found that the least expensive housing option median increase was about 70 percent, Tim. Cheapest housing option at Binghamton, which is an hour and change south of my alma mater, Syracuse, more than doubled over that span, topping 10 grand for two semesters in a shared room. Looking at my my alma mater, Katie, Syracuse, close to $8,000 a year if you're the cheapest room. That's an open triple with two other people, and that doesn't even factor in the amount of money you're paying. <laughs> To eat in the what, is, what is Bailey talking about? He went to Syracuse. Uh, obviously. No <laughs> worries. He's, he's, only, he's only dropped that name like I mean, 12 times. You, yeah. you got to have like the workout facilities within the dorm rooms. You got to have the pools, uh, you know, near the dorms, Katie, because wow. mm -hmm. we're talking college These here. Some fancy schools. Yeah, yeah sounds Back like, in my right? day. Uh, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Tim, you're really planning ahead here because uh, you, you, have you have little kids. But let's bring it a little bit closer to home uh, because there's another really fascinating story on the terminal about child care costs. Uh, some startling data in here. If you take a look at the average cost in the U.S. for full-time in-home infant care, uh, such as a nanny, it clocks in around 39 thousand dollars per year and as a result uh, Kelsey Butler of course on our print team uh, writing and reporting that a lot of parents are basically putting on side hustles when it comes to driving for a ride share service or working part-time at a daycare etc wow. because the cost of actually you know caring for your small child is going up and up and up is, Tim I weren't I'm is not Tim sure okay is, is he I, I don't think I, think I see but I'm like one sweating a little bit right now go down the side of his face. Uh, Still smiling, you know what's frustrating though. about this yeah okay back in 1986 oh. was the first year that Congress allowed you to you know use pre-tax money put away pre-tax money for a dependent care FSA the limit that Congress set back in 1986 was $5,000 you know what that limit is today no. in 2023? $5,000. $5, it is not indexed to inflation. I'm going to, so, send, I'm going to send you a story, Tim, okay. about exactly why this program was designed to fail. Oh. Wow. Is it depressing? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll send it to you. Can you send it to me? All right. I got to go. I'm going to read the story. I think we have to go. I'll read you know, the we got story. a show to do here on TV. Yeah, we Tim. do too. You know, yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Yeah. We got you know, to talk they got about cameras the and lights and everything. It's expensive.
All right, well, don't go anywhere. You think child care We're going to be back with you guys in just a few minutes. We cover everything from child care all the way to college and everything <laughs> in between. That is going to do it for now. We'll be back together live on TV, radio, and YouTube. You on also on Bloomberg Originals. It gets better, right? It yeah. does it? <laughs> all right, 4 p.m. for Beyond the Bell coverage. We're going to take you through today's market close. And we do continue our coverage right here on Bloomberg Television, counting you down to the closing bells here on this Wednesday afternoon. Joining us right now is Kelsey Barrow, J.P. Morgan Investment Management's Vice President and Fixed Income Portfolio Manager. To talk, I guess, a little bit more, I think, about this so-called mission accomplish banner. It wasn't really a banner, but it was about the closest thing I think we'll ever get uh, from the Fed to saying that, yes, the fight against inflation is won. The market seems to be taking that to heart. Is that premature? I don't think it's yeah. premature. Um, mm -hmm. So here's the thing. Everyone that I, I'm listening to a lot of people talk about the Fed. Everyone's trying to understand what they are doing. And everyone's focused on the differences in the messages between the different FOMC members. I'm more focused on the things that they all agree upon. Mm -hmm. And they actually agree upon something really, really important, which is the Fed's done hiking. If you look at the dot plot, there isn't yeah. one person who sees the Fed funds rate higher than the current level. And if you look at the dot plot, there isn't one person that doesn't see the Fed funds Funds rate lower by 2026. Okay. So essentially, it's a little bit less, in my view, about the disagreements about when they're going to start cutting, but actually the fact that they're done. And that's what's most important for the bond market, because when you look back at every rate hiking cycle in the last seven of them, bonds have outperformed cash by an average of 13%. So that's why you're seeing the bond markets perform as well as they are. We have gotten confirmation that the Fed is done hiking. That's where all of these central bankers agree. And it's driven by the fact that inflation is coming down faster than central bankers had hoped and expected. Does that translate, particularly for equity investors, does that translate into better times ahead? So I do think that the Fed has surprised us all by being able to thread this needle. Uh, the soft landing opportunity has increased. And that's essentially because the Fed now has the latitude to start adjusting policy rates lower because inflation's come down enough so that, yeah, maybe growth stays decent. Um, we see the labor market is slowing, but it's slowing in what I would call a linear fashion. Mm. So it's a step down. If you look back, what were, was job growth, private job growth in November of last year? 330,000 per se. Now, where is job growth? The average over the last six months, private payrolls, 130,000. Mm. That's happened very, very gradually. If that gradual deceleration continues, coupled with inflation continuing to come down and central banks being able to normalize policy, I mean, that's a pretty good backdrop, a very benign backdrop that should be good for not just rates, mm. uh, treasuries, but also credit high yield and investment grade. That's exactly where I want to go because you take a look at spreads and they are just super tight. I mean, investment grade, we're about 100 basis points, 330 when it comes to uh, high yield. And uh, it really feels like we've been narrowing and narrowing. Yeah. Where's fair value when it comes to the credit market? When you think about those very tight spreads, does that reflect the risks that there are? Katie, I, I have a really good stat for you here because okay. We're looking at spreads too. We're trying to determine in terms of valuations, has the market gotten ahead of itself? We would agree relative to recent ranges, spreads are tight, but they can stay tight and they can get even tighter. So what we did is we looked back at the IG spreads uh, from 2001 to today. Uh, they're on average, 33% of the time, uh, IG spreads trade within 110 basis points. Mm. So it's actually not that unusual to have periods of time where spreads are tight, but they stay tight. And in those environments, you want to keep carry in your portfolio. So we're very focused on making sure we have that high quality carry in our portfolio, whether it be investment grade, whether it be agency mortgages, uh, those are the areas that we're focused on. How are you feeling about credit risk though? I mean, you mentioned IG spreads. Is this still an up in quality environment? That was the, uh, the sort of touchstone for, through much of this year, but especially as we uh, hear more and more about soft landing optimism, of course, the Fed cutting rates next year. Do you go out the risk spectrum here? 
So I think the tone is shifting there as well. Um, and it's interesting, you're seeing in certain markets that were very strained by higher interest rates. You know, the top that comes to mind are one, like the small and regional banks, and also things like real estate. They're getting a lot of uplift mm. because they're seeing the opportunity in the future uh, for refinancing to be a little bit more uh, reasonable, refinancing rates to be a little bit more reasonable. Um, so I think there actually is some scope for a higher or lower quality high yield companies to also continue to outperform here. This is a window. We don't know how long this window will last, but we want to be part of it as, as it's still available. All right, Kelsey, it's always great to talk with you. Really appreciate you stopping by. That is Kelsey Barrow of JP Morgan Investment Management. Now coming up, we'll get insight on the state of luxury shopping this holiday season. Our guest is Mark Metric, the CEO of Saks. And as we head to the close, and some insights out of uh, Liz Ann Saunders, Chief Investment Strategist over at Charles Schwab, on a big reversal here in the markets. And what to watch in Micron's results coming up after the bell with the stock up about 60% this year. We'll break down the global competition in the memory chip sector. All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just a little more than about 43 minutes until we get to the closing bells. We should point out that really over the last uh, 30 to 45 minutes here, we've seen a pretty sharp reversal in the market. Now, stocks have overall been on about a seven-week long winning streak, largely thanks to some of the names you see on the screen behind me, including financials, which remain on a tear. Bank of America up 4%. And in fact, most of the major indices that track the financials and banking stocks, that's doing really well, largely because of the drops that we've seen in interest rates. But you can see some of the other names behind me, some of the red on your screen here. You are starting to see some people really pick and choose here, whether that's taking profits or maybe just taking a closer look at valuations. A seven-week rally now put in jeopardy here as some people take some chips off the table as we head into what is going to be the final trading week of the year next week. An S&P 500 down about a percent on the day. At one point on the day, it looked like it was going to rise almost a percent here on the day. We've seen similar reversals in all of the other major indices here, despite no real news crossing the wire. We should point out that volume is light as we head into what for most people is going to be a very very extended a holiday vacation here with Christmas on the Monday being a national holiday here in the U.S. A lot of people have already started to take off. When you look at some of the individual stories here, it still is about some of the macro conditions, whether the economic data holds up, whether interest rates remain supportive, and whether the dollar itself remains supportive as well, at least for today. That's not the case. Katie? Well, you mentioned the holidays, and let's transition now to holiday shopping because the online retail platform Saks has unveiled its latest luxury pulse survey for the holiday shopping season. It found that 75% of luxury consumers plan to spend the same or more compared to last year. It also found that luxury consumers plan to shop later, and 64% said that they plan to shop mostly online or online only this holiday season, which is an increase of 15% over just last year. Joining us now to break it down is Mark Metric, the CEO of Saks. And Mark, it's those online shopping figures that uh, always surprise me. And with that in mind, 64%, does that change how you're thinking about your physical stores? When you think about your flagship, for example, does that sort of become a showroom rather than where people are actually making their purchases? You know, I don't think so. I think that, you know, especially in luxury, it's it's theater and you have to be there when they want to transact, how they want to transact. And, you know, there's still 36 percent of the people that are going to shop mostly in store. And that's a lot. Uh, so you got to be there. You got to be there to create inspiration. Uh, and, you know, we remain very, very excited about the partnership that we have with the SFA stores here at Saks.com and how the customer gets to experience the brand uh, all the way around. And when it comes to this shopping season, of course, the lead up into Christmas and beyond, what are you seeing so far in terms of what your luxury customers are actually spending their money on? You know, it's interesting. And the survey that you, you sort of spoke about earlier in the segment, uh, folks indicated half their spend was going to be self-purchase. Uh, so there is giftables and there are things that people certainly buy for other people, but you see them buying for themselves. We are a GOAT company. Go out and travel. So you're seeing a lot of what people are going to wear on vacation or out to dinner or the parties they are going to for the holiday. So it's everything from evening wear, suiting, 
boots, shoes, outerwear, you name it. And then on the gifting side, look, we're seeing that continuation of diamond and gold jewelry. People love giving that as gifts, and it's you know it's right for the season. Uh, and then beauty. Beauty is always a big gift-giving uh, category as well. So, look, uh, folks are spending, and they're spending on a wide variety of what we offer across the site. Yeah. Uh, so it's very exciting. Uh, w- talk to me about discounting, though. Are those folks looking for sales? Are they looking for bargains? How much have you had to offer discounts and promotions to get those sales done? Yeah, we're probably, you know, on a promotional basis, probably about the same, maybe a little bit less than last year on promotion. Uh, so not much. Uh, inventories are in very good shape at Saks, uh, so I'm not too worried about that. But yeah, cu- the, the customer's always going to be looking for a deal, no matter what. The market could be wherever the market's going to be, and people want to pay less uh, than what things cost. So we got to do that. It's, it's threading a needle, but uh, if you have exciting product and great product, yeah. uh, people are going to well, I'm curious as to how you maintain that excitement specifically for Saks. We know overall in aggregate people are spending and spending at levels that I think have defied a lot of expectations here. Also, I'm sure you know there has been a lot of discussions about uh, the business model of sort of uh, the traditional sort of department store model uh, where you're basically be acting as kind of that middleman between the manufacturers of these uh, garments and the people who buy them here. Has that changed at all how you're viewing the structure of this business going forward? Oh, for sure. And look, what Saks did, what we did uh, back in 2021, when we separated the e-commerce uh, from the stores, we sort of started to reinvent the model. Uh, and there's been so much uh, over time talked about the disintermediation. Uh, that's not the answer. The answer is finding a raison d'etre for us um, in the e-commerce world. And we have, and we continue to do that. It's everything from our brand. We can act as a luxury authenticator. Uh, we are where people come for inspiration. Uh, The data, as the world moves to a much more uh, private uh, place, and that's great, uh, first-party data is going to become very key uh, for folks as third-party data becomes uh, different. So even the DTC folks that were able to start up a lot easier a bunch of years ago are going to need a business like ours to help platform and to help reach new customers uh, that are uh, luxury-focused. So, uh, look, it's about reinvention. It's about having the right strategy. It's about remaining steadfastly committed to luxury, which we believe uh, is important for our strategy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's here for the long term. You know, luxury is a long game and we're playing it. And uh, Mark, of course, we're having this conversation as we continue to watch developments in the Red Sea, of course, violent there, really disrupting a lot of shipping routes. Has that had any impact so far on your merchandise? And do you have any uh, plans there, should it? Uh, We're a lot of air, um, candidly. Uh, So... That hasn't really uh, presented itself as an issue at this point. Uh, so we'll watch it carefully. Um, but uh, th- that's not one of the issues uh, that, that we're focused on right now. All right, Mark, really appreciate your time. That is Mark Metric, of course, the CEO of Saks. And you take a look at the markets right now. Romaine, again, uh, just about 40 minutes ago until the close, and we are still very much down. Yeah, very much down, and it's a pretty big reversal. We had about seven of the S&P sectors were in the green uh, just really about an hour or so ago. Right now, only one sector is in the green. That's communication services, and that's largely on the back of a big gain in Alphabet here. But overall, that rally that has basically unfolded over the last seven weeks, at least for the S&P here, appears to now be being put on pause here. No real news, so maybe this is just profit-taking. Maybe this just is... The fact that a lot of people have now kind of moving away from their desk, heading off for their holiday vacations here. And, well, the people who are left to their own devices right now, I guess, are pushing the sell button rather than buy. There you go. And uh, maybe that's the case, especially, again, I keep coming back to it, the bond market not seeing that same consternation. So uh, we'll see how this shapes up in the final uh, 40 minutes or so. A lot to cover here as we march to the close here. Stick with us. We'll be back in a moment. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's get to the latest on the markets right now. You're looking at the S&P 500 currently off by about 1%. That is the biggest drop uh, in about a month or so or towards the beginning of this month. Again, no real news, no real catalyst here. So uh, this obviously could be technical in nature, Romain. Definitely technical in nature. We should point out the S&P 500 really for the last, I think it was six or seven sessions, has been in overbought territory and a similar story for the NASDAQ here. So hitting some technical marks here that might be triggering some trades on a relatively low volume, low participation day. Stick with us.
This is the countdown to the close. Just about 30 minutes left to go here in the trading session, a trading session where we've seen a pretty big flip in sentiment. Yeah, all of a sudden it got ugly. The S&P 500 down about uh, 1% or so. Of course, we were flat starting at 2 p.m. You take a look at the sector level. It's more of the same story. Communication services is your loan gainer right now. A lot of that, all of it, basically, is that rally that we're seeing in Alphabet. We'll see if the uh, se sector, rather, can hang on to those gains. You go down the list, it is a sea of red. Down at the bottom, you have financials, you have consumer discretionary, and consumer staples. It's been a rough year for this sector, a rough day today, off by about 1.7%, Romain. Yeah, and I just want to point out that number at the far right of the screen, that's 6.4%. That means this is more than 90% of the stocks in the S&P 500 are down on the day. Katie talked about one of the few bright spots was that communication services sector, and that's largely because of Alphabet. The share is up about a percent here. At one point, they were up more than 3%, and this is back on a report that Alphabet is going to tweak its ad sales business a little bit and investors seem to like some of the details that they heard. We should point out the details are still relatively scarce. Nevertheless, that's not stopping investors from pushing forward. Look, take a look at Garden Health. Those shares down right now about 9%. Remember, they make this blood test to screen for uh, colorectal cancer, and they're still awaiting an approval from the FDA. They submitted that application in March of this year. We're now just learning here that finally the FDA has scheduled that advisory committee panel to meet in March of 2024. Normally, that would be a good sign because it shows it's on the docket, but the interpretation for a lot of reasons that are kind of uh, beneath me here right now seems to be more negative, and that's pushing the shares lower. Cinemark Holdings down 5% here on the day on the back of a downgrade over at Wells Fargo that says all the optimism about the box office heading into 2024 is way too optimistic. And Micron shares also down about 4% here as we head into the close. They're scheduled to report earnings after the bell. Katie? And as we mentioned, of course, the S&P 500 currently off by about 1.1% in a really quick plunge here with a look at what exactly is going on is Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Yeah, this one really came out of nowhere, Katie. It's the first time that I can remember that we've seen such a quick bearish reversal in quite some time going back even prior to the last uh, six or seven weeks of rallying. And here you can see this decline and uh, the acceleration of it, the speed of it, down 1.2 percent, the worst day since October uh, 26, so basically the day before the big rally started. Interestingly, Tim, Tim Senevic on radio, he pointed out that we're now basically at levels on the day of the close of December 13th or after the Powell pivot. We are not, however, at the levels uh, prior to Powell speaking, and it does appear as though we might go there. Other indexes are also in on the decline. As for the what, that's hard to pin down. I've been emailing with Chris Murphy over at Susquehanna. You can see the NASDAQ 100, the FANG index, SOX, and Russell 2000, broad-based participation. He agrees on the idea that it could be profit-taking too far, too fast. Not that these uptrends are parabolic, necessarily. But if we go into the Bloomberg terminal and take a look at an indicator of momentum, the RSI, and I was about to send this out to folks, uh, the RSI had been the most overbought. Take a look at how quickly this happened. The RSI had been the most overbought at, let's call it 81, 82 since 2020. And even before I could get that note out about half an hour ago, it's already reversed into not overbought territory. That is a bearish signal. That suggests that there's a big change in momentum. Chris Murphy also saying that some of his customers are are saying that if you look at the S&P 500 zero date options expiration, uh, that that volume is out of control. He's not sure that that's really it, but there could also be a gamma squeeze on a particular S&P 500 put trade. What, when we put it all together, what's really interesting, Katie, we might be looking at the first down week in quite some time. It is, of course, only Wednesday, but if we take a look at a three-day chart of the NASDAQ 100, I believe it's still going to show a decline. Yes, so we might, in fact, be looking at a – it's very small at this point, but because of the degree of the recent rally over the last six or seven weeks, this index up nearly 20 percent in that time period. This kind of stands out. Abigail, I uh, appreciate your instant analysis there, and that definitely is one to watch, of course, coming off of seven straight weeks of gains for the S&P 500. But let's pivot now and talk about municipal debt, because it's time now for our muni moment. And today we're going to focus on how falling U.S. Treasury yields are affecting the municipal market. And here to do that with us is Kim Fredericks. She is Fixed Income Managing Director over at Kane Anderson Rudnick. And uh, Kim, let's start with your notes and that muni treasury ratio, because as you point out, in October, 
October, it was between 70, 75 percent typical levels. Right now, it's at 59 percent, which means that uh, munis have gotten expensive in a hurry. How sustainable is that? You know, in some ways it is, in some ways it isn't. Um, right now, you have a huge amount of money that's going into fixed income, and a lot of it's going into uh, ETFs, mutual funds that need to get invested, and they just want to get money to work. So I think a lot of that is just people putting money right in. Um, now, people like myself that are doing more, you know, SMAs and, and paying attention to that kind of thing, really don't want to buy into those kinds of tight levels and, and get involved right there. Something underneath 60% just really doesn't make sense. And talk to us about the relative valuation here, because, I mean, we're talking about the past two months or so, this uh, big rally that we've seen in munis outpacing even what we're seeing in the Treasury market. Looking into 2024, I mean, where do you th see the bigger opportunity? I know it's not uh, necessarily an either or kind of market setup, but uh, which market stands to benefit more from this Fed backdrop? Oh, I think definitely munis, always. I mean, munis are always going to be, to anyone who's paying taxes, munis are always going to be the place to be. Um, you're always going to get a huge advantage there, and that that definitely helps out. Now, they have tightened extremely quickly in this last month. But, you know, going forward, when that eases up a little bit, when a little of the kind of year-end window dressing pressure goes away and we get things back to normal, um, then it's definitely, you know, back into munis and, and time to, to get involved. I mean, you know, you're talking about very high quality credits and, yeah. and uh, you know, a lot of yield without paying taxes. And not only high quality credit, Kim, but something that I've, I've found interesting over the last few months are the number of uh, uh, companies and issuers that we've seen actually get upgrades uh, from some of the ratings companies here. The idea that some of the companies that it looked like they were really against the ropes uh, at maybe at the start of this year, at least in the eyes of some of the credit or rating companies, maybe they finally sort of put that behind them. Well, yeah, a lot of issuers, you know, a lot of issuers kind of going into the pandemic, whatever situation they were in, they've got a huge amount of funding during the pandemic. And what we're seeing now is coming out of that with the pandemic funding going away, um, all of that boost to everyone's revenues, all the big tax revenue surges, you know, it's everyone's being upgraded. We we're seeing just under five times as many upgrades to downgrades from most of the rating agencies right now, which is just huge. Um, the big thing to watch going forward is going to be how well they sustain that. Did they use those funds in the right places? Are they, you know, did they get their reserves in line? Did they pay down, say, a pension obligation? Uh, you might think back to New Jersey making their first full um, uh, pension contribution in something like 20 years a couple of years ago. Um, and they've done it, you know, two budgets in a row. So. Um, you know, taking advantage of the bump in funds to yeah. kind of use it right and pay things down. I, I am curious. I just want to ask you a broader question here, Kim, just about a kind of the attractiveness of being in this business. And particularly, I don't mean necessarily trading in the secondary market or even buying the issues, but for some of the firms that help to underwrite this. We've seen some of the big Wall Street banks retrench a little bit with regards to some of their public finance units, Citigroup itself getting completely out of it. But you have others uh, that basically have just said, we're kind of whittling away around the edges because they don't see as much value in it relative to, I guess, what they can get in other uh, uh, other areas of fixed income and in dealing with those markets. I am curious about the competition between fixed income assets right now. And I know the tax advantages that munis have, but when you adjust that for whatever additional growth you may get elsewhere here, how does it compete? Well, you know, really, there's there's two things about munis. There's the fact that you actually get the tax advantage, and then there's the fact that the income that you're getting from the munis is not added to the top of your tax, you know, your income pile and then sort of written off. It just plain doesn't get added in. So in that sense, it doesn't ever bump you into another tax bracket. So there's a lot of advantage to the tax-free income. Um, from the perspective of the business side, um, city, you know, leaving and other firms uh, moving out, you're seeing a lot of the regionals pick up that business. Um, but there's also been a huge lag in issuance versus what you would expect right now. 
um, just basically because, you know, rates got down to nothing and are have come back. And, you know, if you didn't refinance your town's debt when munis were paying 1%, you know, why are you issuing new debt to do it now? So I think, uh, you know, this tightening in rates um, is going to play into the hands of a lot of muni managers, you know, municipal managers who waited yeah. to, you know, issue debt, and they're going to get an opportunity now. But as you stated, they're probably going to end up going with a regional yeah. dealer rather than you know, city or one of the big guys. All right, Kim, I'm going to have to leave it there. Always great to catch up with you. Uh, Kim Fredericks over at Kane Anderson Rudnick, a closer look at the Muni market. And I just mentioned how a little bit earlier this year we learned that city was getting out of the public finance business. We're now learning, according to uh, Bloomberg reporters, that city has decided to also exit its distressed debt trading business. Of course, Jane Frazier has said she plans to re-overhaul this firm a big time here and another a unit that apparently is going to go by the wayside. This is according to people familiar with the situation. The Bloomberg reporters have spoken to. We'll be back in a moment after the break. Stick with us. This is The Close on Bloomberg. We want to go back to that breaking news on Citigroup. The company said to be uh, to exiting their distressed debt trading business. Uh, Bloomberg reporters uh, citing people familiar with this situation, uh, saying that Jane Frazier's uh, big revamp uh, of the overall uh, company here is now going to include shuttering the distressed debt trading business. And it's a very specific slice of that credit team. But remember, this was a credit team that kind of got rebooted right before she took over in 2021, uh, kind of uh, got rebooted right before the pandemic. And then she took over. And now we're starting to see a retrenchment in that space. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, we're talking about City, one of the key players in distressed debt markets. And this news uh, made all the more interesting, of course, when you think about last week, breaking the news that uh, City is also shutting down its municipal bond business as well. So a lot yeah. of news coming out of City. And this is a big deal because I think people forget they're distressed debt trade. I mean, they're I don't know if they're where exactly they're ranked, but they're basically like in the top three mm -hmm. or less uh, right now. So to say that whatever, I guess they're I don't know if it's not profitable or they're just not don't think the juice is worth the squeeze here. But the fact that they're willing to walk away with that, I guess, it, a, it shows the discipline that Frazier has in terms of uh, executing her vision. But of course, it also means uh, quite a few people are going to be looking for jobs. Exactly. And you think about that vision, Jane Frazier announcing in September that she would undertake the biggest restructuring of city in decades, trying to make the company more efficient, efficient, eliminate layers. Obviously, this yeah. is part of that. All right. City shares are down about uh, one and a half percent. We should point out they were actually down before uh, that story crossed the wire, as is the broader market uh, off the session lows, but down about a percent here across the board. Lizanne Saunders over at Charles Schwab going to be joining the big program in just a second. Stick with us. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is The Countdown to The Close. Romaine Bostic here, joined now by Scarlett Fu. It's going to help us walk to those closing bells and take us to the bell and beyond. A quite an active day here in the markets. A 1% decline right now on the major indices, something we haven't seen in about two months. Yeah, and of course, the volume was light heading into today's trade and heading into this afternoon, but we've seen it pick up as the sell-off has accelerated. Abigail was talking earlier about the oversold conditions. U.S. stocks were very overextended. All the big caps were trading above, uh, or the RSI was above 80 for the first time since September 2020. So it doesn't take a lot for that yeah, to come around. And those overbought conditions and how persistent they were too. Because yeah. usually when you hit those levels, it usually takes a day or two where you start to see the shakeout. It's kind of been camped out there uh, for uh, more than a week here. Uh, we are going to continue uh, to break down some of the broader market action, but we do want to get to some breaking news uh, just, just crossed the wire a little while ago involving Citigroup, which is said to be exiting the distress debt trading business. It's the bank's latest retrenchment in its effort to reshape the firm in pursuit suit of higher returns. Catherine Dordery joining us right now who covers uh, this for us here at Bloomberg. Uh, give us a sense here as to, I guess, the significance of this unit. So this follows their recent retrenchment from municipal mm -hmm. trading. Yeah. So this is just 
another uh, part of the business that City is cutting. They're looking at what is the least profitable parts of their business. Mm -hmm. And remember, distressed debt is a very, very nuanced niche marketplace. Yeah. So when you have a desk like this, you have to have very specialized traders, analysts that are helping your clients. And if you are a large player or you've built a reputation over the years, it might be profitable for you. So Bank of America, Goldman, they're banks that also have distressed debt offerings. City, their decision to do this, they're just showing that they're going to put all of their resources elsewhere. Mm. So they still have high yield credit trading, um, and that likely will remain. Um, mm. But distressed debt is a very specialized part of the credit market. And I'm glad you mentioned those other businesses, because this begs the question, what other department is at risk of being trimmed back, of being uh, eliminated at this point? I think that you're going to see these very niche uh, marketplaces, the ones that they'll look to see, is this something that we're really the dominant yeah. player here? Um, but with yeah. uh, with municipalities, they city at one point was the dominant player. So you have to see how things change over time. Um, but this is a, a very significant um, pullback for them because there's not a lot of distressed debt players out there. So when you see one retreat, that's an opportunity for their competitors. All right, uh, Catherine Doherty uh, helping us to break down this story here uh, on Citigroup here. Big breaking news on that company and some big breaking news right now on Warner Brothers Discovery. According to Axios, they're reporting that Warner Brothers Discovery is in talks to merge with Paramount. And of course, Scarlett, you know there's been a lot of speculation about the future of Paramount. Yeah. A lot of stories uh, that uh, they've had some folks kick the tires and that uh, the folks who are in charge of Paramount, they've certainly been receptive to offers here. We don't have a lot of details and we should point out this is from Axios. Yep. But nevertheless here, it does appear uh, that we could start to see that consolidation in the streaming space that we've been talking about for some Yeah, time. but it hasn't happened yeah. yet. Clearly the Redstone family is in discussions with all different kinds of players, but Warner Brothers Discovery would be an interesting one given that they still have a lot of debt that they have to service from absorbing uh, the Warner Brothers assets to begin with, right? David Zaslav runs this company, and one of the big issues was the interest costs of the debt and yeah. how to manage the cash flow of the company. So it's interesting that they would take on potentially Paramount and merge yeah. that when they're still not done consolidating everything uh, with Warner Brothers. A good point here. We're going to try to get you some more details on that in a minute. Paramount shares flipping from red to green, and Warner Brothers shares sinking deeper into the hole here on the back of that headline. Let's get back to the broader market here with just six minutes until the closing bells. Lizanne Saunders, Charles Schwab's chief investment strategist, joining us right now. And Lizanne, I want to talk first about, despite the red that we're seeing on the screen today, prior to that, there seemed to have been a pretty significant shift in sentiment. This idea that the Fed was out of the way, economic conditions were favorable, and eventually we would start to see corporate fundamentals catch up with valuations. Is that narrative still intact? Well, I think at the last part of it, Romaine, is probably where there might be some disconnects. Uh, first of all, there's a disconnect between what the Fed is essentially, not telegraphing, but, but the, what the dots plots say is the path for rates next year, which is three cuts, and of course the market having priced in closer to six cuts. So something is going to have to to give there. But I think with regard to corporate fundamentals, you know, estimates, there is a big swing factor for 2024 relative to 2023, um, up to double digit growth for the S&P and more than 30 percent or so growth for an index like the Russell 2000. But the question is the long and variable lags and the fact that for a lot of companies, particularly well capitalized companies, they've been earning more on their cash, courtesy of high interest rates, than what they have to, to pay on their debt. Mm -hmm. But some of that will start to, to shift. They'll be earning less interest. And then certainly for less healthy companies, there's that, that rollover into higher uh, cost debt. So I, I'm not sure how realistic the consensus estimates are for 2024, because there are so many moving parts uh, that go into those estimates. So that that could be a, a bit of a, a kind of a hitch for, for 2024. All right, thank you for giving us the broad outlook here for 2024. But I am curious in terms of today's price action, how much can you really read into what we saw this afternoon? Uh, the extension of the bond rally that's taking place, but you know, not so great demand for the 20 year bonds. And of course, this reversal, this quick reversal that we've seen in equities. Does that signal anything about nervousness uh, into 2024? I, I don't, you know, one day is is hard to sort of glean a trend from. But it, given that you've seen such an extraordinary rally, the breadth of it 
has all else equal been very strong. You have uh, an index like the Russell 2000 up nearly 25 percent since the late October lows. Uh, you saw such incredible reversal reversals in terms of things like you know S and P equal weight going in only about a month from a 52 week low to a 52 week high. I think it's not surprising maybe that there was sort of some money saying maybe we want to book some profits uh, here. So having a little bit of consolidation given the strength of the move is not terribly surprising. We've been saying that frothy sentiment, all else equal, does probably represent a, a bit of a near-term uh, risk. And that may be some of what we're seeing today. All right, Lizanne, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there, but it's always wonderful to catch up with you. Have a great holiday, and we'll talk to you, you soon too. again, I'm sure, Thank in you. the new year. Lizanne Saunders over at Charles Schwab, helping us march to the closing bells here. Scarlet Foo with stocks now uh, hitting fresh session lows, 4702 on the S&P 500, down more than a percent. And it's interesting, given the eco data that we did get today, which showed that the housing market yeah. is holding up fairly well, yeah. um, that Goldilocks scenario that everyone was talking about seems pretty intact. It's not clear what the catalyst for this reversal is today. Uh, mm -hmm. aside from thin trading at this point. Yeah, thin trading and some technical levels that were clearly being tested here. We should point out at 1.4% lower on the day. I was just taking a look here. We really haven't had a meaningful move lower in the S&P 500 all year long, a 2% yeah. loss, and that was back, back during the SVB crisis here. But since then, not a whole lot. Stick with us. We're about to take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell, here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Tim Stenovic and Bailey Lipschultz. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms on a really intriguing day in U.S. equity markets. It started with stocks trying to push higher here, extending that rally, but a big reversal a couple of hours ago that now has all the major indices down by at least a percent or more. Yeah, we're seeing the selling continue uh, into the uh, late session, Romaine with the uh, S&P 500 at its worst levels of the day. Hey, we just spoke uh, to Alan Zafrin over at IEQ Capital, and he said, look, I'm not surprised by this. I'm a bit guarded when it comes to this market. I think that the markets have gotten ahead of themselves. In fact, if you look at what the Fed projected, they projected three rate cuts, but the market is projecting six rate cuts next year. And, uh, you know, not just that, but he's, he's also worried about a recession in the early part of next year. So he's a little contrarian to what we've uh, seen from the equity and bond markets of late. I just want to call out right now that we have more than 480 of the 500 components in the S&P 500 trading lower. So we've been talking up breadth the last few days, broadening away from the Magnificent Seven. Well, yields are down a number of basis points right now, and you are seeing the weakness continuing to spread more broadly, something to keep an eye on. But again, uh, holiday season, end of the day trading, volumes are relatively stronger than maybe expected, but uh, not too much to read into it, probably. Yeah, and the way the volume has picked up since about 2.30 in the afternoon when the sell-off really picked up steam uh, is interesting as well. It begs the question, how does this set us up for the rest of the week, uh, especially with so many people still expecting a rally into the end of the year? The S&P 500 had been in overbought conditions for seven straight sessions, peaking at about 82 in Tuesday's session here. So once again, some of the technical levels probably working uh, in favor of this downturn that we're seeing today. And with just 19 stocks uh, in the green here on the day, this is going to be the broadest sell-off that we've seen in the broader market going back uh, to mid-March when we had the whole fallout from the SVB crisis. Here are your numbers for you. The S&P 500 below that 4,700 mark, a close right around 4,698, down 70 points or 1.5 percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down by 475 points or 1.3 percent. The Nasdaq Composite is losing 225 points on the day or about 1.5 percent. And the big laggards are in that cyclical and small cap space. The Russell 2000 down 1.9 percent. S&P 400 mid caps down 1.5 and Dow transports guys down 2.4 percent here's something that's interesting that i just found uh on the s p 500 we're now at levels that we last saw tuesday december 12th scarlet so essentially s p 500 giving up all the gains that it saw in the wake of the uh fed chair jay powell press conference mm. and the press release from the federal reserve on wednesday 
Well, let's take a look at how the sectors are uh, performing today. There, usually we talk about the gainers. There's one group that gained, and it's barely gained, and that really is media entertainment. That's Alphabet uh, that's keeping that group in the green. Beyond that, your outperformers are telecom stocks and energy stocks. Energy, of course, uh, following oil prices higher, at least uh, earlier in the day before they reverse their move. On the downside, autos and components losing more than 3.5%. Semiconductor stocks losing 2.9% as we await Micron's earnings. Yeah. And the transportation names down. 2.7%. Yeah. Well, speaking of Micron, a perfect timing, Scarlett. Micron earnings crossing the wire right now uh, for the fiscal first quarter. Revenue coming in at about $4.73 billion. That looks like a beat. The street on average was looking for about $4.5 billion. As for uh, the adjusted loss per share in the quarter, that came in at $0.95. Cents. So that's a little bit better than what the street was looking for, which it anticipated the loss of a dollar per share. Cash flow in the quarter coming in at about $1.4 billion. That's also a beat versus street estimates on average of about $1.25 billion. And the operating loss also smaller than expected at $955 million. The street was looking for an operating loss on average of $1.05. And of Bill. course, yeah, the, the big question here is the commentary that the company gives regarding uh, this fiscal second quarter, the quarter right now, because last time they did speak, they indicated that pricing is certainly looking better and uh, maybe profitability, a return to profitability is in the cards in the in the you know, six to yeah. one period. Uh, here's their forecast uh, going forward on the revenue side for the current quarter that we're in. This is their fiscal second quarter. The company is saying that expect to see adjusted revenue in the range of 5.1 to 5.8 billion. The street on average was looking for 4.99 billion. So the bottom end of that range, uh, Tim and Bailey, uh, is basically above the average of a uh, street estimate. Okay, so you got to remember that Micron updated its first fiscal its fiscal first quarter late last month. So that's what analysts wanted to see, Romaine. And look, you know, this stock is up, Bailey, more than 60% so far this year. So, you know, read into any moves that we see, especially before the call with a grain of salt. Yeah, and we've been seeing it's no NVIDIA, it's no AMD in terms of share performance. One thing to keep an eye on, we did see options still, even with that pre-announcement, implying a north of 4% move. So when you look at this uh, aftermarket move, as you mentioned, ahead of the call, keeping an eye on it, but also look at Pure Western Digital right now up 1.7%. Yeah, absolutely here. And we talk about, you kind of use this idea that they're not uh, NVIDIA. They don't necessarily have the sexiness of an AMD here. Mm -hmm. But that's what they want. And they've made that clear that they need to be reckoned with, too. They may not necessarily have the sizzle, but they have a lot of the same substance, I think, that uh, NVIDIA and AMD have, or at least they're trying to get it, uh, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to the AI space. And I know the businesses are different in a lot of ways here, but if they can sort of articulate a narrative on that call and, and really beyond that call, that they are true, indeed true players in this space, maybe that that gives them uh, the ability to catch up here, Scarlett. Well, the storyline that they're really pushing right now is higher pricing and how the company is benefiting from that. And one thing that analysts were looking for was the second quarter gross margin forecast. And we do have a number here from Micron. Uh, it sees second quarter adjusted gross margin in the 11.5 to 14.5% range. Analysts were looking for a gross margin of 6.4%. So that's also helping support the share price in after hours trading. Yeah, worth repeating uh, some of these numbers. Micron seeing second quarter adjusted loss per share between 21 cents to 35 cents. Estimates were for a loss of per share of 62 cents, Bailey. Uh, shares of Micron moving higher in the after hours after second quarter sales forecast did top estimates, Bailey. Yeah, we're seeing in another thing to call out, Tim, in the numbers, cash flow from operations, 1.4 billion, better than estimates for 1.25 billion. But again, context is everything. This is a stock over the last 12 months up 55%. Yeah, and I guess it raises the question, though, kind of what the future is. I mean, we know all the hype uh, over the last year re regarding AI, and there's a lot of concerns here that maybe that went way too far too fast with the big pull forward with a lot of companies just kind of experimenting and not really making any money off of it other than the folks who were selling the picks and shovels. So the question is sort of what does 2024 hold uh, for that sector? I'm going to be watching for any commentary that the CEO gives about China because we know that China's banned companies from buying Micron chips. Um, and of course, Micron is working on making up for the lost market share. The question is how, what is their game plan, what is their strategy, and just you know any kind of hard numbers in terms of how the Chinese restrictions are impacting their business overall. Well, I'm looking through the uh, press release, which uh, just crossed the wire. President and CEO Sanjay Marotra saying, quote, we expect our business fundamentals to actually improve throughout 2024 with record industry total addressable market projected for calendar 2025. Uh, he calls out the high bandwidth memory for data center AI applications and how that illustrates the strength of Micron's technology and product roadmaps and argues that they're well positioned to capitalize on the immense opportunities when it comes to AI and that AI is feeling across uh, our market. So again, another company um, that's looking to capitalize on the AI interest that we've seen over the last year.
And one more time, the best comparison for this company is Western Digital at WDC right now up 2.2%. So you are seeing some of this read across everyone wanting to go where AI and chips and kind of the future of technology are going. When you look at this result, uh, pretty strong, and we are seeing that show up in some of those peers. And so when we talk about this idea of, I mean, and I just want to go back to your point, Scarlett, on China, mm -hmm. because we've seen some of the issues that NVIDIA has gotten itself into with some of the workarounds, if you will, here. And we know the Biden administration has been pretty forceful. Uh, uh, Gina Raimondo has basically said, look, don't do this or, you know, we're going to come after you here. So I kind of wonder what the options are. Either you have that retrenchment, which I don't think is viable for some of these companies, or uh, maybe you do try to test the will of the U.S. government and whether they really will crack down on you. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something we'll be speaking with really uh, later on. Willie Shi, the professor of management practice over at the Harvard Business School, has done a lot of work on semiconductor companies. And what he points out is that as much as Micron is a U.S.-based company headquartered in Boise, most of their production is overseas in Japan, Taiwan, and China. So this this China ban is is really impactful. All right. Well, I'm certain that and most, gonna... and most of their sales, I think half their sales are from overseas as well, outside yeah. the U.S., I yeah. should say. Yeah. yeah, certainly something we're going to hear analysts ask about on the call a little bit later. Hey, that is going to do it for our cross-platform coverage of Beyond the Bell on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio, and on YouTube. As a reminder, uh, Bloomberg Business Week, also available on Bloomberg Originals. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place. And we continue our coverage here on Bloomberg Television, a slew of breaking news crossing the Bloomberg Terminal right now. And no one gives it to you better than us. Warner Brothers Discovery, that's the story we're talking about right now, and the potential for it to merge with Paramount. There's a report out by the folks over at Axios that said David Zasloff, who heads Warner Brothers Discovery, was in New York on Tuesday speaking with Bob Backish, of course, his counterpart over at Paramount, about a tie-up of the two firms. Bloomberg's Paul Sweeney joining us right now uh, from the radio booth, and before uh, he took took over as our radio MC here. He spent a lifetime on Wall Street covering these companies here. And I, I guess it's not surprising that Sherry Redstone is looking for, I guess, a partner or a buyer or something. We know that for a while now they've been looking for a way or, or, or some place to put these assets. I think I think you're right. I think yeah. this is all about scale in the industry. Everybody in the media industry, the traditional media players are, are chasing Netflix and they know that the technology companies are really coming into the media business. So Disney made its big deal buying a lot of the assets for Fox several years ago. Warner Brothers put itself together uh, as well uh, with um, Discovery, mm -hmm. and but that's still not enough. And if you're yeah. Paramount, you really look subscale here. Well, this is what I'm curious about because I do want to focus on uh, Discovery and the Max rebrand here. They have a lot of properties on that, right? And the idea of adding Paramount to that is that really value additive? I mean, I'm not. I know some of the programming that Paramount has, but is that a price that it's worth paying for Zaslav to add into the Max uh, empire? I think if you, I think the the logic behind a lot of these media yeah. executives today is. I can't get too big here. I, there's not a scenario where I don't need more scale because, mm. again, my competitors are Netflix and there's, and there's some of the big technology companies. Disney's probably in a good spot there. That's what most people feel like. But everybody else has to really think about what to do. And David Zaslav um, is a deal maker. Yeah. He he's a, loves to do deals. And so this one makes a lot of sense. And Paramount is desperately subscale relative yeah. to some of those big players. Uh, Sherry Redstone needs to do something. She is the control shareholder. Her national amusements is a control shareholder for Paramount. You have to, uh, she, I think she's probably made that decision. Can't be too big, except that regulators might get in the way and say, you know what, this doesn't work to combine HBO with CBS and all the other properties and Showtime. I mean, you have just shrunk some of the market uh, significantly. My question here, and you mentioned David mm -hmm. Zasloff is a consummate deal maker. He comes from the GE school, yep. uh, and he's about financial engineering. They have a lot of debt right now. Yeah, they do. How are they going to take on Paramount? And I know these are just discussions. Well, actually, Warner Brothers Discovery, they've done a good job getting their balance sheet in order. They actually have a pretty solid balance sheet. You can't say the same about Paramount. Mm. Paramount actually does have some debt issues coming up. It needs a solution for that, uh, much less the competitive a aspect here. So, And then from a regulatory standpoint, uh, Warner Brothers Discovery does not own a broadcast television network. So the regulatory scrutiny likely... Uh, will be less than if Comcast, which owns NBC, mm -hmm. tried to buy uh, another media company that has a broadcast uh, network. So I think... So it's cable plus broadcast is okay. That's okay. Any, so. any sense that if for some reason Zasloff and Redstone don't reach a deal, that there is another potential suitor out there for Paramount? I think there is, because they're really good yeah. assets, um, and there's probably not a good capital structure, yeah. and their scale is not ready. So, But at some point, I think most people feel like once Sherry Redstone makes a decision to sell, a deal will happen.
Paul who, Sweeney. Oh, I'm sorry. Just one quick question. Who is not likely to be a buyer? I mean, could Netflix come into this at all? Or no, Amazon? yeah, I don't think Netflix, I don't think any, any of those companies, I don't think the technology companies, although a lot of people would like a technology company to come in and buy Paramount, but that's not likely to happen. All right, uh, Paul Sweeney uh, uh, from uh, Bloomberg Radio, uh, helping us uh, break down here the latest news. Again, this is uh, Axios report here uh, that the two heads of Paramount Global and Warner Brothers Discovery actually did meet face to face on Tuesday in New York about a possible merger. We do want to get back to some other breaking news, and that is on Micron. There's earnings crossing the wire right now, and the company did beat across the board here in the most recent quarter, and its guidance for the current quarter also coming in above estimates. Shares higher by 4% here in after hours trading. Pierre Farragut joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this. He's the global team head of technology infrastructure at New Street Research. All right, Pierre, just tell me straight out the gate here, what jumped out at you in this report here? Why do you think we're seeing such a positive reaction to it? Well, we, we know Micron spoke like only a few weeks ago and guided up, um, you know, something approaching 4.7 billion. They exceed 4.7 billion in revenue. So people feel very good about like the very, very recent trends in the, in the industry for, for Micron to beat the guide they gave just a few weeks back. It's, um, it's a very positive signal. The broader picture now, um, what I tend to look at is things people tend not to look at too much looking at memory. I look at COGS, really cost of goods sold for me in memory means a lot. Yeah. Um, and what you see today is that the COGS of Micron exceeds $5 billion. So that's an annualized run rate uh, exceeding $20 billion. And that's really the COGS is what gets out of your factory in the memory business and is what the market really is absorbing. So that's the best indication on, on where demand is today. I am so if you look at revenues, hmm? yeah. Sorry, well, go ahead. well, before you go on, I, I am curious. I mean, particularly on the cost side here, because we saw margins expand here. What, what actually is driving that? Is this the idea that with all the demand for AI chips and the memory needs associated with that, that they were able to charge a premium? Was that what led to uh, the the expansion in margins? Yeah, it's a very good question. Right? No, this is what is going to happen probably in one year from now. But the reason why margins are expanding today is simply that as this demand has come back above, um, you know, where it was uh, six quarters ago, now Micron is in a position to use uh, its fabs more fully to better fill in, you know, its production capacity. And they still have their inventory between them and the market. So you still have $1.5 billion of excess inventories. And this is what is keeping the prices down still quite a lot. So these inventories are going to go away in the next six to nine months, like one and a half billion dollars of inventories are going to disappear. And then Micron is going to be with this very healthy position where end demand will be higher than what the industry can produce. And that's where pricing power comes back. In the memory business, demand can grow as much as you want. If demand is still not enough to absorb your inventories and what you can produce, mm -hmm. you don't have pricing power. But once your inventories are gone, and demand are above what you can produce, then you start, you know, telling the market what price you're going to sell it to. So, so you just have to to wait for Micron to get back to the margins where they were, you know, six quarters ago, like uh, you know, around fifty percent on a base of cogs right. that will largely exceed twenty billion dollars, and that's where Micron is going to surprise a lot. Pierre, how, how much of this improvement that we're seeing at Micron is the result of Sandre Morotra's team versus kind of just waiting for the market to, to turn, waiting for the cycle to turn? That's a very good question. I think Sanjay's team, and uh, um, they have done an amazing job um, over the recent years. And it, you don't really see it, you know, from one quarter to the next one, uh, because like the economics of memory is really like driven by the macro 95%. Mm -hmm. You see, like, the press and the good job of uh, Sanjay and the team um, in the technology roadmap, in the fact that today Micron is basically ahead on almost every front uh, when it comes to move to the next node uh, to advance toward, you know, uh, uh, HBM3E, which is going to be the next generation of very high-end memory chips and, and dyes that are going to, use in, uh, to be used in AI clusters. So basically... Uh, what Sanjay and the team have done is secured Micron as a very, very efficient, very healthy uh, competitor in this three-player market. Um, and variations in margin and things like that have relatively little to do with that. It's, it's just about like the, how the macro drives the balance right. between supply and demand. 
Okay, and of course, one question that's definitely kind of come up, and I'm sure it's going to be more than one question, is China and how Micron is adapting in this new environment in which uh, Beijing has banned Chinese companies from purchasing Micron chips. What are we, beyond saying that uh, they're making up for this lost market share, what strategic initiatives have you seen Micron take that will really pan out here? Yes, so here is the situation in China, you know, the, uh, Micron basically is in a world in which you have a lot of tensions between the US and China. Um, would you prefer Micron to, to be like uh, on the Chinese side of this, uh, of this tension or on the US side of this tension? I much prefer to see them uh, on the US side. Uh, and that's basically what's happening today. Micron is very big on the chip acts and is going to benefit on the chip acts. Uh, Micron is probably the most, you know, uh, involved player in terms of supporting the development of leading edge manufacturing in the country. This is very positive for Micron. This is like giving Micron a lot of goodwill. Um, and so Micron is actually emerging as a very, very strong, like a, a, as a flag bearer, I would almost say, uh, in, the, in, in the effort to, um, uh, to, to, to develop and main, maintain and develop leading edge manufacturing uh, in, uh, in this country and in, uh, on, on this continent. So in the long run, it's going to be a positive. In the short term, Micron is an easy target for Samsung, for, uh, sorry, for China. It's relatively easy for China to, to start talking about, you know, deprioritizing Samsung and um, la, uh, getting Samsung out of their supply base. Um, but as you said, you know, yeah. what matters in memory is how much supply, how much demand. And so if you lose a client in China, as long as there isn't a, a competitor adding supply to meet that demand in China, you will meet demand somewhere else. So five years from now, Micron will have very little exposure to China and all the market shares they've lost in China, they will have regained it somewhere else because the three players are very careful not to change production market share, supply market share, and that's what matters. All right, Pierre, always wonderful to talk to you. Pierre Farragou, Global Team Head of Technology Infrastructure over uh, at New Street uh, Research here. And I think there's an interesting thing here, uh, Scarlett, when we talk about a Micron and its place in the broader semiconductor sector, more importantly, in that broader AI, what is, I guess, becoming an AI sector yeah. now here. I mean, the shares have done pretty well. I mean, it's up more than 50% on a year-to-date basis here. But, of course, you compare that to the Nvidia. monster run in NVIDIA, and there are a lot of people saying, oh, what's Micron doing? I, I guess they're just taking... A maybe a little bit quieter approach to this? I mean, after all, it is just memory chips. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. It is memory chips, and they need to pivot uh, here. And AMD is seen as kind of the, the runner-up to NVIDIA. But even then, it's it's way behind, right? Yeah. NVIDIA is, owns this market. 70 80% um, feels like AMD is just kind of picking up the pieces after that. So Micron is still far behind, but it is a growth story that investors can really uh, get excited about. And it gets to the point, too, is like, I mean, like, how does Moroda sort of expand the business, uh, whether it's taking advantage of AI, but just in general, mm -hmm. you know, getting it beyond the perception, I should say, the perception that it's just kind of a commodity business. That's an, it's an yeah. old school chip maker, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. which is why I was asking Pierre about how much we can really credit this improvement to what uh, Morotra and his team are doing versus just the macro conditions having improved. Yeah, absolutely here. Anyway, the shares up 5% in after hours trading. So investors uh, clearly liked uh, something that they saw in that release. So uh, we'll keep an eye on this and bring you any additional news coming out of Micron as we get it here on the show. But once we come back from the break, we do want to go down to Washington because this year was actually a big win for banking technology and pharmaceutical giants as the gridlock in Congress halted any new legislation and regulation for many industries here. We're going to talk about why and whether that could change. That's coming up next here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. All right, here's a really interesting stat. Here in the U.S., just 22 new laws have been passed here in 2023 so far. That compares to 281 new laws that passed last year in 2022. Now, that turned into a relief for a lot of industries out there, mainly those whose profits were spared from the additional regulation and oversight. Bloomberg's Stephen Dennis wrote about how banks, technology, and pharmaceutical giants were actually affected by the gridlock in a positive way, and more importantly, whether they can expect a repeat of that next year. Uh, that stat, 
uh, Stephen, really just like floored me when I saw it this morning, although I guess I shouldn't be surprised given all the dysfunction here. I guess my biggest question right now is we're heading into an election year where I think historically you usually have a lot less activity in normal years coming out of Congress because nobody really wants to stick their neck out for anything. Right, but we do have a lot that has to get done. We do have the spending packages that didn't pass this year. We've got the spending deadlines in January 19th and February 2nd coming up. We have this big fight over the Ukraine supplemental, uh, along with border security, that sort of soaked up all the oxygen. There hasn't been a lot of uh, time left over for th fights over things like credit card competition, lowering insulin prices, marijuana banking. Some of the priorities that uh, Democrats like Chuck Schumer have been trying to push across the finish line. In fact, Sch Schumer earlier today sort of said, hey, these are all going to be priorities next year. But there's no guarantee any of these things get through the Senate, let alone the House. And the House, of course, has been at war with itself, yeah. uh, dumping uh, Speaker McCarthy. And, and they really, you know, are, are having a hard time passing any bills over there. So what's interesting here is you talk about banks and tech giants and big pharma winning, but it's not as if they haven't been put under the microscope because they are being uh, subpoenaed and invited to speak before uh, members of Congress. It's just everyone's kind of spinning their wheels. Nothing comes out of it despite a lot of grandstanding on both sides. Yeah, I think, you know, if you're these industries right now, uh, banks, railroads, etc., you kind of have to be looking more towards administrative regulation rather than congressional regulation. You know, Congress is so gridlocked, you know, that it's set up for them to win by not having things happen. But there are efforts by the Federal Reserve on capital requirements. Basel III is coming. There's lots of other things that they have to worry about that could crimp their profits. But, you know, there, there certainly were concerns on things like the Credit Card Competition Act, which would mandate another network other than Visa and MasterCard for big credit card transactions. That was potentially a $10 billion a year hit to the financial industry and win for the retailers. So the retailers kind of lost out here. And you also have things like marijuana banking. That's a huge industry, growing industry. They got something out of the banking committee in the Senate, but that still hasn't come to the Senate floor. And, you know, that's also another situation where the turmoil at the top of the House could have an impact because Kevin McCarthy had supported a previous version. Yeah. So it's not clear that's going anywhere either. Uh, and I'm curious, I mean, I mean, how much, I guess, room is there going to be for them to maneuver around that stuff, particularly given that the bigger budget issues still need to be sorted out uh, in January? And um, my guess is they'll just kick the can down the road to something else. But is there a sense here that some of those secondary issues, if you will, they can find some compromise on, or should we not actually hope for it? I think one of the things to watch for that does have a lot of bipartisan support uh, in the tech space is this child privacy and safety online legislation. There's a lot of bills sitting on the Senate calendar. Schumer mentioned it today as one of his priorities for next year. There are a lot of Republicans and Democrats who want to protect kids online. And, and we'll see. Time We've had tech legislation heading for the floor in previous years on things like antitrust or trying to ban TikTok. Yeah. Uh, you know, these things tend to be resisted strongly, and, and the tech companies and their lobbyists have been very good at delaying, and then sure. delaying equals profits in many cases. Well, that's what they're getting paid for, and we know that uh, the tech companies have really added to that arsenal of uh, lobbyists of late. Stephen, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Stephen Dennis joining us from Washington here. Coming up on the close, uh, we told you about how Micron shares are rising in after hours trade. We're going to get more insight on its results and global competition in the market for memory chips. This is Bloomberg. Taking a look at how markets performed on the day, not well. 
They opened higher here on the day and looked like they were going to push towards what could have potentially been an eighth straight week of gains, but a big reversal roughly about midday as a lot of folks, I guess, reassess valuations and reassess some of those technical levels that the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, and some of the other indices are bumping up against. The S&P 500 has spent the past seven sessions in overbought conditions. That flipped a big time today here with 484 members in that index lower on the day. That's more than 95% of the members in that index losing on the day. We have have not seen a broad-based sell-off of this magnitude uh, going back to uh, mid-March when the collapse of SVB uh, started to shake folks out of this market. Now, we should still point out here that the markets are still uh, nursing some pretty healthy gains on a year-to-date basis and even on a month-to-date and quarter-to-date basis here, but with volume waning as we head towards the, the Christmas holiday on Monday and, of course, the end of the year in about a week and a half here, the price action, of course, could get even more extreme in the days ahead. Scarlet. And, of course, uh, we continue to see the move higher in uh, Treasury prices, pushing those yields down. We want to bring you some um, more analysis on some breaking news we gave you earlier. Warner Brothers Discovery reportedly in talks to merge with Paramount. This is according to Axios. Uh, so, of course, we needed to bring in Bloomberg's Felix Gillette. He is author of the book It's Not TV, The Spectac Spectacular Rise, Revolution, and Future of HBO, which is, of course, one of the crown jewels of Warner Brothers Discovery. So, Felix, we know that Paramount is is in play. Yeah. Uh, Shari Redstone and the Redstone family looking to get some help with that company. Does it surprise you that David Zasloff and Warner Brothers Discovery is interested in maybe kicking the tires here? It does not surprise me at all. I mean, there's been this widespread acknowledgement that there needs to be more consolidation in the streaming universe that we're seeing. Um, and I think Paramount is under the most pressure. Uh, you know, the Paramount Plus streaming service is losing a huge amount of money. And uh, the Redstone family is under a lot of pressure to merge, find a buyer. Um, it makes sense that Warner Brothers Discovery would be you know, reaching out and having these talks. They have their own pressure with Max. Um, you, know, you can see a lot of synergies if you combine the Paramount Plus streaming service with Max. Yeah. Um, you'd also have CBS News, CNN, CBS Sports with all the Warner Brothers Discovery sports assets. There's a lot of kids programming on both sides you could combine. Um, so that's the, you know, the case for it is that you would be having a lot more scale. You'd have yeah. more programming to compete with Netflix, is, Disney Plus. Is Max, is, is Warner Brothers Discovery, are they, are they struggling in the streaming space right now? Uh, you know, I think they're under a fair amount of pressure. They have a huge amount of debt from yeah. the, you know, the initial merger. Um, and they're still way behind Netflix in terms of global reach. Yeah. Um, and so, but does, I guess I pose that question because how does adding Paramount's content to, you know, let's just face it, I mean, HBO Max, or Max, whatever we're calling mm -hmm. it these days, yeah. it has a pretty good lineup here. And I, and I would say it's probably much broader yeah. than what Paramount offers. Yeah. So I'm just curious as to how it ends up being additive to whatever Zaslav's mission is here. Yeah, I mean, I think they still, it's kind of the old thought that bigger is better, that yeah. you have a huge library that you'd be adding in. Yeah. Um, you have all of this, you know, I mean, Paramount has a really rich... Uh, amount of franchises. You think of like South Park, you think of all those old Nickelodeon shows, they have yeah. a lot of kids programming, um, probably more than Max currently offers. Um, you they know, so James, do they have the James Bond films? Is that Paramount? Or, uh, that uh, is yeah, Mission uh, Impossible. I think. Yeah, Mission Impossible. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. There's there's lots <laughs> of franchises. It, it's, I think, it's like it's like fake James Bond, but anyway, that's <laughs> yeah, a whole that's a whole another conversation. Sorry, Felix. <laughs> yeah. So I think yeah, the, just more. Just yeah, you know, we're gonna give you more yeah. programming more family material, more, you know, for the whole family. Yeah, give people reason not to turn away from their platform. So right. the question here, I think, for consumers is, if there is consolidation that everyone says is necessary, will this result in lower prices for consumers? Uh, you would hope so if you're a consumer, <laughs> but I don't see that happening anytime soon. That's I me mean, laughing in Zazzle. Yeah, we see right now the trend is, you know, we're going to uh, tighten our belts and raise prices at the same time. So I don't see these prices of these streaming services coming down. All right. Well, then I'm future. against this deal. <laughs> Felix Gillette, thank you so much. Felix, of course, here with Bloomberg News and author of the book, It's Not TV, The Spectacular Rise, Revolution, and Future of HBO. All right, let's get back now to the chip space because we told you earlier about how Micron reported results. And we wanted to dive into the major issues that Micron and the global memory chip market faces. It, of course, is one of the largest segments of the semiconductor industry. So we want to bring in now Willie Shi. He is professor of management practice at Harvard Business School. Willie, thank you so much for speaking with us. What is it about the memory chip market that I think um, people tend to overestimate that 
uh, the companies themselves have any kind of sway over when it is so subject to macroeconomic trends like demand uh, and borrowing costs? Well, Scarlett, uh, you're right. I think people say this is a commodity business, uh, but the reality is you can't build, you know, whether there is a phone or a notebook computer or a cloud data center. You know, you consume a lot of memory chips, okay, but people tend to assume that this is just a commodity sector which is highly cyclical. Now, we've seen that in uh, the patterns of Micron's earnings over the last couple of years, of course, because, you know, we went from shortage to oversupply. But this has been a pattern that has been going on for many, many years. So then people say, oh, commodity, I don't want to have any part of that commodity business. Mm -hmm. Okay, but when you kind of scratch the surface and look a lot, uh, a little bit deeper, you find it's a strategically very important sector. Uh, that's why China has been so interested in memory chips as well, because, you know, you can't build most electronic devices without memory. Okay, so it's strategically important, and it takes a lot of capabilities. If you look at how many players there are in the sector, you know, the big guys are mostly Asian, mm -hmm. okay? And here we have Micron based in Boise, Idaho, holding their own against the likes of Samsung and SK Hynix and uh, some Japanese companies. But most of the production uh, is in Asia. Uh, this was the industry that the U.S. lost to the Japanese in the 1980s. And then we have Micron in Boise still hanging on and actually doing pretty well competitively. Doing pretty well competitively, but as Micron will be the first to say, they are, of course, looking ahead to AI and what that business could do for um, their growth prospects. How do you see a company like Micron balancing the commodity side of the business, memory chips, with moving into higher margin AI chips? Well, it's a balance, as you say. And uh, I think you use the commodity side to really drive a manufacturing scale and learning, right? In other words, I got to be able to uh, bank these things out in volume and uh, uh, get good yields. That's where all the money is. And, and you, you learn that on the commodity side. But, you know, what they're doing is they're doing things like high bandwidth memory, okay? And they're doing a lot of memory designs for, uh, you know, some of these AI applications that, uh, you know, the best way to add capability to any kind of processor is to increase the memory bandwidth, okay? And they clearly understand that. So it actually plays a central role in like a lot of high performance applications, right? So it, you know, the design comp part of that, and therefore, you know, you get more differentiated product when you serve those markets. Uh, so it's, it's a strategically very important play as well. And I think people are beginning to recognize that. And I think that's why you're seeing some of this hype around AI, but it's all about, you know, when I'm doing these large language models, the cost of processing all these things, how much power I use, how much, uh, how much uh, processor resources I have to use because I'm starved for memory, right? Mm. So doing that kind of balanced system design, yeah. there's, there's a lot of legs in that. It, it, do they have, I guess, a bit of a moat around that though, Willie? Because I do wonder if there are some of those other competitors in this space, uh, some pretty, I guess, maybe not quite in quite the hype as some of the other companies, but there are other folks doing the same thing, or at least trying, to, let me say trying to do the same thing. So is there yeah, a worry I, there for, for Micron? Yeah. There's, all, there's always that worry because, you know, you have very large bets, uh, you know, in the latest generation technology. I actually had the opportunity to visit their operations in uh, Boise back uh, this past summer, and they've got some pretty good capabilities. I was actually surprised at some of the things that they were able to do just in terms of their research fabs and what kinds of processes they're working on, some of the other uh, tools and the mask making and things like that. The problem they're trying to do with, you know, stacking memory chips and getting very high density and very high bandwidth, that requires a lot of capability. So if you're looking for a moat, that is a little bit of a moat, right? This is not just making commodity memory chips. Uh, you know, it's, it's a balance of the two in the portfolio. And I think the downside on the commodity side is we see what happens to them on earnings on this cycle. Uh, it's looking pretty good now. You know, they, uh, you know, things are looking up for them. The other sense I get from them is they're pretty astute around how do I time my capacity, right? I need to time my capacity with the up, up okay. cycles and not have excess capacity yeah. on the down cycles. I, I saw, for example, one of the things they did is 
They took out some of their excess capacity, moved some of the tools into some of the more research applications yeah. and stuff that they're trying to bring up in the future. Right. So it's a balancing act. Yeah. There are not that many companies who are good at it. And, you know, we can see that because there's been a huge consolidation in that industry over the last two decades. I mean, there are basically three or four players standing right now. Yeah. All right, uh, Professor, always uh, great stuff. Always wonderful to catch up with you. Uh, Professor Willie Shee over at the Harvard Business School helping us walk through Micron's earnings here. We should point out that conference call underway right now. Shares still higher here in after hours trading. Coming up after the break, we're going to check in on consumer sentiment and consumer spending with Jerome Martis, Director of Consumer Research uh, over uh, at the LSEG. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. U.S. consumer confidence rising in December by the most since early 2021. More Americans growing more upbeat about the labor market as well as the outlook for inflation. Let's get more from Bloomberg's Reed Picker, Pickert, who is on the economy team. Reed, how much of this can we chalk up to lower interest rates? Because all the evidence when it comes to the job market is that the job market is still cooling. So people are certainly excited to see that the Fed is anticipated to cut interest rates next year. And we're already starting to see the kind of ripple of markets expectations that those rates are going to come down um, in mortgage rates, which have a big impact on how folks view interest rates more generally. We've seen mortgage rates come down, you know, over a percentage point since the end of October. Um, and when we think about what consumers are seeing right now, they're seeing gas prices that have, you know, fallen a lot since a couple, couple months ago. Mm -hmm. They're seeing good headlines about inflation coming down. They're seeing a labor market that's held up, you know, remarkably well, including, you know, a recent pullback in unemployment, the unemployment rate. And so there's a lot that they can see right now that shows, you know, good news for the economy. I am curious, when we get to uh, Friday and we get the latest uh, monthly uh, personal income and spending data, most of the economists' estimates are expecting to see a tick up in that, both in terms of income and spending here. Uh, Ona, when you adjust that for an inflation, inflation that has come down, is that still growth we're talking about? It's still growth that we're talking about. And, you know, one thing that I think, you know, showed up in the retail sales data that we've already gotten um, was that the lower gasoline prices helped people have a little more cash to spend on other things. Um, so that's certainly a good I, good thought, especially when paired with a still solid labor market for people's ability to, to spend going forward. Um, but I think one thing, you know, the main thing that at least I'll be looking at in Friday's report is the fact that the data that we got last week right smack dab in the middle of the Fed meeting um, showed that that PCE inflation gauge that the Fed targets, that that core gauge on a six-month annualized basis could very well be right around 2%. Um, so it'll be interesting to see the data and see if that totally bears out. Reed Pickard down in Washington there. A look ahead to some of the retail uh, and consumer spending uh, data that we're going to get a little bit later in this week. We know consumers are spending. The big question is, what exactly are they spending it on here? Oh, so you're just a few days away uh, from the Christmas holiday where everyone, Scarlett, should have had their shopping done by now. Yeah, no, but for those folks yet. who maybe haven't quite done it here, uh, let's see whether they're going to find uh, anything left on the shelf oh. and whether it's going to be worth buying. Jerome Martis, Director of Consumer Research over at the London Stock Exchange Group, joining us here in studio, too. Jerome, great to have you here. Thank you for having on me. On the program. And I mean, I kid Scarlett, but in all seriousness, for those folks who did do their shopping early versus those folks who maybe did wait to the last minute, are they going to see a material difference in pricing? No, they're not. In fact, the average discount has withheld very well steadily the entire year. What has changed is that more merchandise is on sale. In fact, it's the most amount of merchandise we've ever seen, mm -hmm. even compared to pre-pandemic levels. LSEC discovered mm -hmm. in a collaboration, <laughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. with Centric Market um, Intelligence. So what we're seeing is that over 50% of all merchandise is on sale. Yeah. But the average discount, excuse me, it won't be, um, it will yeah. be less than 40%, which is the, which is the benchmark. I yeah. feel like 40% is something that like I could respond to, but I'll respond better if it's 50 or 60%. You want 50 or 60%. Yes, yes. You think you're going to get that before That's Christmas? That's why I've been waiting so long. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> Among th other th reasons. Th those were available around Black Friday. 
Uh, yeah, no, I don't do and cyber, my, and cyber and cyber week. Those, those have now come down. What, what, what are people? I'm curious. What are people yes. are really spending on? I mean, where are you seeing kind of uh, the most growth in terms of uh, in terms of actual units sold or revenue being generated? So the most the revenue went in went to hotels, restaurants, and leisure into 2023, and mm. that is actually projected to still be the strength yeah. next year. We're expecting to see that be the strongest the strongest sector. Yeah. And in terms of individual retailers, Amazon is projected to not only beat earnings estimates, wow. but beat every quarter next year. Are you buying your stuff on Amazon? It's too sure? late now. I yeah, can, can you get, get it delivered? Shipping. Do you yeah. have Prime? I, I, I have Prime, but I refuse to pay for the accelerated shipping. So you, I, I put myself in a, I, you know, I, I did myself in a I don't know. What, the, what, what, do you, what do you normally get your family? Is it just, is it just like bubble gum and like newspapers or what? Yeah, that sounds about yeah. right. <laughs> Subscriptions online. Yeah. I mean, I guess the question is, you mentioned, Jerome, that there's a lot more stuff that's yes. on sale, although the extent of the sale is the same. What about inventory? Because one of the themes that we've heard from retailers all year long is how much better they're managing their inventory. They're not over ordering so that they don't have to slash prices as much. Uh, well, that's changed now towards the end of the year. So what we're seeing is when it comes to inventory turnover, how fast they're turning that around, that's actually below par for the bulk of retailers, about 66% of all retailers. So some are poised better poised than others, but this means that now in the month of December, they have to put more merchandise on sale mm -hmm. in order to move that merchandise ahead of January when all that new, fresh spring merchandise gets introduced at full price. Mm -hmm. So what this means is now the consumer is conditioned to expect a discount, which is what we're entering in 2024. So when we expect, we look at sales forecast for 2024, that's expected to remain within the three to five percent sweet spot we saw this year. Mm -hmm. But earnings are expected to drop because of higher, of more merchandise being on sale, and less the, and and, the, and and yeah, inventory not turning around so fast. You mentioned how Amazon is the unequivocal winner here, right? And earnings will beat, and the sales will beat uh, every quarter in the following year. I was just at Best Buy, and I was kind of surprised how many big screen TVs there were are still on the showcase floor, um, given that we're so close to Christmas and the prices are pretty attractive. Is it still the case where people are going to the brick and mortar stores to kind of shop around and price compare, but when it comes time to make the actual purchase, they end up doing it on Amazon. Yes, absolutely. That is still the case. Um, and sadly, Best Buy is one of the ones that suffer because of this. In fact, Best Buy, out of all of the inventory turnover between the second quarter and the third quarter, they have been deteriorating the most. Mm. And it's it's because they've been a victim of sh the showrooming, like what, exactly what you're describing. And uh, when we look at also at the projections of next year for online spending, that's expected to, to still grow in the double digits. So uh, for the most part, yes, the amount of money consumers are spending online will continue to grow into the next year. Um, it, will be, it will be about 18 percent of total retail um, spending in the United States. I am curious about the competition between uh, spending money on, on physical goods versus some of the services. And that's been a big narrative this year. But there does seem to be a lot of anecdotal evidence. I mean, we sent a lot around a lot of people yes. on Black Friday to yes. go out to the store. And they were saying, yeah, the stores were full. Yes. No, it was buying. They were buying <laughs> coffee and donuts and, and restaurant stuff, but they weren't actually buying actual clothes. Or, Absolutely. So yeah. the consumer is yeah. still spending on goods. So they're just being pickier where they're spending. So they, they want high end designer clothing, but for less. So TJX, Ross are, are projected to do very well next year. Mm -hmm. Costco and Walmart for everyday low prices. And then you have those specific retailers that have a loyal customer following. And these are Amber Crombie and Fitch, oh, yeah. Lululemon, Lululemon yeah. Ralph Lauren. Yeah. And then you have um, Free People and Anthropology, which will boost sales at Urban Outfitters. So there are some specific companies that have loyal customer, but for the most part, consumers are being pickier. They prefer, to, they are gravitating towards travel, flight tickets that have are projected to go down. Right. So that Thank might God. stimulate even more sh uh, more, <laughs> more travel next year. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be a lot of spending between now and uh, Sunday because I have to go buy my presents. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm not alone in no, doing not. that. Um, what does this, how does this set us up for the new year in January? Because there's always a bit of a hangover in yeah. the new year because people have overspent, overextended themselves in the rush to the holiday. So what me, what, what actually might happen is that we might starting start to see those discounts that you want. Mm. You were talking about if you had that 60%, you would be more enticed to open up your wallets. If that merchandise hasn't moved this weekend right before um, Christmas, then that's going to be the issue because we're already seeing that the trend has been like 
a lot of merchandise on sale in the month of November, and then it spiked even more in December. And if it hasn't sold this weekend with procrastinators, then January come, they will have to discount them in order to move that merchandise right. to make room. Everyone's getting presents in February. That's, that's <laughs> there you go. You that, that's the way to go. Have you done your shopping, all your shopping yet? You're I done? have, yeah. yes. Of course. Yes. She probably has a game plan that's <laughs> I know, very complicated. She probably saved more I than work all of those us. discounts. Yeah. I do try to get that 60%. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jerome, always wonderful to Thank talk you. to you. And if we don't see you before the end of the year, have a great holiday. And I hope uh, uh, you get uh, some heavily discounted uh, <laughs> gifts uh, here uh, for the holiday season. Jerome Martis, Director of Consumer Research over at the London Stock Exchange Group, helping us break down some of the consumer spending trends this holiday season. As we go to break here, when we come back, we're going to set you up for what to watch tomorrow, some of the big potential market movers over the next 24 hours. This is Bloomberg. All right, time for the part of the show where we set you up for what the markets will have their eye on over the next 24 hours, and we start in Turkey. Yeah, they have a rate decision, and they're seen raising their one-week repo rate by 250 basis points to 42.5%. Okay, I can't really wrap my head around I know, that. it's hard for any Let's of us. Let's come back to the U.S. Maybe we can wrap our head around the latest update on the third quarter GDP here And this will be the third and final read. We yeah. know the economy went gangbusters in the third quarter, a 5% handle, 5.2%. We'll see if it stays at that level. And a big interview tomorrow. The U.K. Chancellor uh, Jeremy Hunt is set to speak with our very own Lisa Abramowitz at the Burn Financial Services event. Yeah, we'll definitely come. I'm sure inflation will come up and how they plan to tackle that. Absolutely. Earnings tomorrow, including Nike and Carnival. Thanks for joining us here today on The Close. Stick around. Balance of Power coming up next. Scarlett and I will be back tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.